I can. We're still we're still talking about old dogs for just a second. Thank you. You there? Okay. All right. I'd like to call to order this um, August second, twenty twenty four, State Board of Dentistry meeting. And it looks like we definitely have a quorum. Is this this is everybody? We have a full house. Full house with uh, Dr. Kevin Ward, our newest one. Congratulations, Dr. Ward. Appreciate it having you here. Okay, so the agenda, we need to adopt the agenda. We've had, uh, we have a, a minor change under continuing education. We don't need to review that. That's just a renewal down here under 6B. Um, anybody else have anything on that? Nothing? Motion to accept the agenda. No discussion? All, right, all in favor, say aye. All right. Uh, adoption of the minutes. Let's see, we need to tackle these by, um, say, 4-5-2024. And this one has, this one had some um, slight editing. Um, We'll get back to that later, later this morning. But um, the rest of it is just um, additions, corrections, whatever. Who, what do you see? Okay. On page two, hey. um, the fourth paragraph down, it should be Dr. Steve. You get that? He's finding it. Yeah. Anything else? On page seven, under um, the vote for, I have down to seven two. Now you're double mic. Okay. I just feel like slightly terse. Let's hear this one. <laughs> Motion under number 13 says 6 2 item. Anything else? Then on page eight, okay. second paragraph, it should be Miss Couture and not Doctor. Anybody? Anybody know of anything else? Do you see anything else? I did make the change. Yeah. For Doctor Ferrara. Page yes, and then we'll and Leaf will discuss that. Yeah, he'll discuss that, but I made the change for the Okay, day, so. so if you read that early, um, it referred to the reason we denied a license. After research, um, she corrected these minutes, and it's it's reads differently now. And Leaf will go through that with our administrative hearing. I think that's the plan. Yes. Okay. Okay. If she's here. If she's here. Oh, she's here. supposed to be. They're caught in Gen Con or whatever. Yes. Okay. Um, a motion to uh, adopt the minutes as amended. I'll make a motion. Okay. Second. All in favor? Um, All right. Let's move to the next. Um, I don't see that on this. What's the next date? It'd be June what? Uh, 
June 7th. Let me get back to this thing. Okay, anybody see anything that needs to be worked on on that? I'll make a motion to adopt the June 7th minutes. Okay. Second. Okay. Anybody? We're good to go on those? Okay. Motion has been made and seconded to adopt these minutes as amended. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Let's see, we'll kind of skip that for a minute. Um, Dr. Sweeney came in. Um, I didn't see anything. Yeah, okay, Dr. Sweeney, you wanna come up to the respondent table? Good morning. And there we go. And help me, Dr. Sweeney. I forget um, how often you are scheduled to appear in front of us. Um, I thought the last one was supposed to be my last one of the regular meetings, but Cindy uh, told me at the last meeting that she'd like for me to be here at this one. And so I assume this is my last, unless Cindy has something different um my last of the regular meetings to be at okay well, we'll we'll look at that um so tell us about how everything is going Soberlink, all that everything's going just fine um sober links are going well no bum readings this time no bum okay. readings at all um as a matter of fact uh, i did a couple extras we just returned from a family vacation and uh um I did one sober link in the parking lot, I think it was yesterday or the day before, the day before, I believe. And um, I turned sober link off before he had submitted, and I didn't know if it's, it said it submitted, but so I went ahead and did an, an extra one a couple hours later, it, just because I, I was a little worried about making my four quota, and it was nothing just to do an extra one. So I did an extra one, and turns out when I got the report yesterday, it had submitted, but it was no big deal. So yeah, they're all fine. I'm, I'm stretching for these two names, but I think I think I got them. Um, Dr. Partridge mm -hmm. still yeah. kind of checks in oh, with yeah, you in one thing or another. Absolutely, yeah, okay. um, yeah, frequently. And um, Mr. Mr. Kelly, Kelly, Brad Kelly, the, yeah, yeah, meet therapist. with him on a weekly basis, um, and um, that's going well. Um, I still do the Wednesday night meetings over here in Indianapolis. Um, that was part of my my contract with the wellness program but honestly i it's 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 um it's very therapeutic for me and i may still go i'm my limit is up that i would have had done under the wellness program i think i've got four more meetings but i may still continue to do it um i get a lot out of those meetings with other doctors and physicians and dentists alike that uh, attend that meeting and if I recall correctly, Mr. Kelly will provide um, wellness, a wellness report periodically. Is yeah, and he, okay. uh, he provided one to Cindy, I believe, uh, yesterday okay. or this morning. Okay. Um, yeah, if you're in wonderment, um, we didn't have Dr. Ke or <laughs> Dr. Sweeney on the agenda. So anyway, we're just kind of any other questions from the from board members? Guess not. Okay. Well, okay. Well, if we need to. Will he need to have a uh, administrative hearing to get off probation? You'll have to ask for that. I, we don't have the materials, but he hasn't hit the minimum term yet. I think it was just the mandatory personal appearance would last for a certain amount of time, and then after that, he's still. He's on probation for at least five years. Yeah, so okay. It was just he didn't submit. So one day, yes. At this point in time, <coughs> um, we don't have any any other checks or any other appearances from <coughs> Dr. Sweeney. Okay. Can we do one in a year or so, or uh, is this something? It's up on request to the board. Let yeah, me. Yeah. Get his uh, 
right if i if you could give me those terms because we i don't have it on my computer i don't think no, it's not this, so. yeah, yeah you'd have to go back a ways to get to it um While we're in between, welcome YouTubers. <clears throat> For the first year of probation, respondents shall make personal appearances before the board during the board hearing. First year of probation, respondent makes personal appearances before the board at each meeting. After the first year of probation, shall make personal appearances before the board as requested by the board. So, yes. So, yes, if, if you want to make that request right now that in a year it gets scheduled, it seems good. It seems consistent with the order. What do you think, board? I think, I think maybe a year. Check, check in in a year. So we're talking about uh, maybe August 2025 meeting, something like that. Does that suit you, Dr. Sweeney? Gladly. Okay. I'd love to see you get back up here and tell you how good I'm doing next year. <laughs> yeah. We need a vote on that, maybe. Sure, go ahead and do okay. that. Okay. Uh, yeah, let's, let's I'll, I'll move it. I'll move that. Second. Second by Roger. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, so sounds good. We'll see you in a year. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Have a great day. Let's see. Do we know... Um, Terranum Maria? Okay. Um, yeah, come on up. If you'd like, just sit in this uh, seat there. Okay, and and you're here to um, basically we offered a deny we did not offer to um, reciprocate a an Indiana license, and you're here as a, on an appeal, right? Yes. Okay. So uh, this will be a hearing procedure. Okay. Although it's a little different than what we normally have, where we'd have like a uh, someone from the attorney general's office and potential witnesses and stuff. But anyway, let me just start reading. So, Doctor Finley, I'll uh -huh. just after you, yeah, after before the opening statement yeah. part, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is an administrative hearing being held this second day of August, twenty twenty four, at where are we there? Nine fifteen. 9.15 a.m. local time and is being conducted pursuant to the laws of the state of Indiana as found in IC 421.5 before 11 members, right, of the State Board of Dentistry and a cause docketed as administrative cause number 202407 slash DEN slash 0007. This hearing is being held pursuant to the request of the petitioner, Terranum Maria DDS, based upon the board's denial of petitioner's application for a dental license. The notice of time and place of this hearing was mailed by first class mail on July 24, 2024. My name is Robert Finley DDS and I'm hearing, I am the hearing officer of this board. The following members of this board are sitting with me in this hearing. Richard Nowakowski DDS, Roger Sheline, DDS, Jeffrey Snoddy, DDS, Annette Williamson, DDS, Matthew Kolkman, DDS, Edward Sammons, DDS, Kevin Ward, DDS, Crunchy Wells, DMD, Twyla Rader, LDH, Tamara Glickman, JD, consumer member. 
At this time, I will, re I will request that any board member who feels that he or she cannot give this respondent a fair hearing and render an impartial decision remove himself or herself from this hearing. Is everybody in? Okay. Um, appearance of counsel. Um, and we don't have counsel for this. Um, do you understand that you have the right to be represented by counsel? Yes. Okay. I'm still reading. Uh, no. um, swearing in of the court reporter. Will the official reporter designated for this hearing please stand and be sworn? Raise your right hand and state your name. Okay. Do you, do you solemnly swear that you will keep complete and true notes of all that transpires in this telephonic hearing? Um, actually, this is virtual, I guess, and real time hearing and prepare a complete transcript thereof from your notes and faithfully perform all the duties imposed upon you as an official reporter under the laws of the state of Indiana. Okay. Thank you. Um, swearing in of, of witnesses and you don't have any witnesses. Um, my husband is here, but we actually got lost while coming in. So I think he's okay. So he's, he's going to be, not here right now. he'll be he's, a few minutes. Yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll try to catch that. Well, but, but she herself should swear it. Yeah. So, so it, um, if you'll rise, please. Yeah. Um, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give in this cause will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Be seated. Um, the parties in this matter are hereby notified that the board will take official judicial notice of the pleadings, evidence, and orders in this matter. Does either party, um, there is no. So now. That's, yeah. This is where we'll have the Deputy Attorney General give yeah. the commentary. Uh, <clears throat> Good morning, Doctor. I'm Board Counsel. Um, so just to, just to clear up what we have procedurally here, it's my understanding that you received a letter previously that uh, indicated the board's denial of the application, but uh, only mentioned the reason of a prior conviction and, in fact, actually misstated the the name of that conviction um and you just got it supplemented with a corrected copy yesterday is that right yes and so you understand as a result of the letter you got yesterday that um the board what went what went into the board's reason included uh the differing educational requirements of the two jurisdictions and that that's that's part of what you're appealing here today yes and um Regardless of the short notice, I mean, I, it, were you offered the the chance that to continue this if you wanted to, if you wanted more time to prepare, given the new information? I I was, but oh, sorry. Okay, and uh, you're fine with going ahead on the short notice here today? Yes. Okay, uh, and uh, you, you understand that this not that not that a denied appeal ultimately means that you can never apply again, but this is the only appeal of this application, regardless, right? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Leif. Um, board will take official notice of its file in this matter. Um, so would you like to make an opening statement? Yes, I would. Yeah, go for it. Oh, a little green button on that. Yes. Uh, good morning, uh, respected members of the board. Um, I received the, so I started the Indiana license process 10 months ago, and uh, I had been repeatedly calling the Indiana board after submitting all my documents um, to find out the status. At the time of this incident happened, I submitted the positive response documents as well. I come from a family of five generations of doctors. My parents are dentists. Um, uh, I have been practicing in the state of Illinois for the last two and a half years. Uh, I work with the underprivileged society uh, with almost 200 patients a week, um, 800 patients a month. I have not, um, sorry, can I get a minute? I'm just a little anxious. You're, you're fine, just relax and go ahead and tell us. I 
I haven't had any history of complaints or um, violations or any history of malpractice allegations against me in the last two and a half years, despite being in a very high volume practice. I also own my own practice in the state of Illinois. Um, 10 months ago when I applied for the Indiana license was because I was offered an opportunity. Um, an unfortunate incident did happen for which I did hold responsibility. It was not a conviction. It was a court supervision that I was offered and I've completed all the requirements at the state of Illinois. That was asked, um, a letter was submitted by my lawyer as well um, to the board. Um, and I haven't had any history of any violations. Um, the second portion that uh, said up here that the requirements uh, for the state, for the licensure, it said A or B uh, under the code uh, 251215, where when the person was licensed or certified by another state, there was minimum education requirements, which I fulfilled. If there were um, applicable work experience and clinical supervision required in effect, I fulfilled that as well. And if required by the other state, the person previously passed an examination required for the license of certification, of which I have taken the national board as well as the Western Regional examination back in 2019. So I just come here in front of the board um, for a fair chance. That's all. Okay. Um, questions from the board? I know, excuse me, uh, Matt Cookman. Um, I, I know one of our questions was related to the uh, postgraduate studies you did at UCLA. Could yes. you tell us a little bit more about that program? Yes, it was um, an international postgraduate program. I had completed my uh, bachelor's degree back in India, um, five years of schooling back in Manipal College of Dental Sciences. After six months after which I applied for the program, it was a restorative and aesthetic program. Um, for which uh, there was uh, there was no bench exam, but there was an interview. There was a, uh, an examination for which I did fly to America. Um, after which, once I got accepted, which were 12 students of uh, a large number of students at UCLA School of Dentistry, I completed two years uh, during the process of which I learned. My, the reason why I applied for that training was because my parents are dentists. I, at the time, had no idea that I wanted to move to United States of America. My idea, my goal was just to move to America, um, hone an extra skill set, because my father's an oral surgeon, my mother's a general dentist. I wanted to bring restorative full mouth rehabilitations, inlays, onlays, little of which is practiced in India. Once I honed that skill, um, my parents encouraged me that I still take the licensing exam before I move back to India. I did move back, I practiced with them. And then I decided to move back to the United States as I got married. And once we moved here, I started practicing here and now I own my own dental practice. So at UCLA, I learned several skills, which I'm very grateful for. At the time, I didn't apply at all for the DDS program as I wanted to have mentorship under Dr. Richard Stevenson, who at the time was the director of the program. So I had applied just for my skill set that I acquired at the time. Other, other questions? From the board? And then, what for what are you going going to use your Indiana license for? You you say you have an opportunity in Indiana. Yes. If you were granted an, an Indiana license. Yes, I I was offered a job opportunity in Indiana, um, but I was offered that ten months ago, and the kind person offering has been waiting for my Indiana license to go through, and um, it's been ten months since I applied. And I was practically calling on a two weeks basis in order to get a status update. But after that unfortunate incident that happened occurred with me, it I, I, and I understood that my application was in review. Um, so I patiently waited um, only to gather more information 24 hours prior that there was another reason for denial. Um, but the opportunity still stands. So I was hoping 
I was given an opportunity. Other questions, board members? One thing I do, <clears throat> just in case it sharpens any questions, I'll jump in here to tell the board this. That <clears throat> my reading of the situation legally is that although there were two reasons cited, which included a criminal conviction for reckless driving, um, the only one that really gives grounds for outright denial is the uneven, uh, the, the differing educational requirements of the background because reckless driving is not in the board's convictions of concern. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean that you couldn't do a probationary license on that basis, but I do think that in terms of whether or not you uphold the denial, it needs to be, it needs to be on the basis that you still feel the same way about the differing requirements in the background. And Richard Nowakowski. So this, this program that you graduated from is a non-accredited program, is that correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions before we uh, close this section of the hearing? Seeing none, let me find this. <laughs> Pardon? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah you're... So, do you want to try to give him a call and see if he's anywhere around? Sorry, I had turn my phone off. I'm, I'm not sure she can answer this question, but maybe Twyla or Jeff or somebody with the school can. You know, UCLA is an accredited dental school. The program she took is a non-accredited program. Could somebody explain what, you know? So CODA accredited each program individually. So dental hygiene has its own accreditation. Even though we're under the umbrella of the dental school, we are accredited separately than the DDS program, as well as the ortho program, the pedo program. They go through their own accreditation process and they have their own accreditation standards, just like the IDP students do too. <clears throat> so that means so that any... UCLA can offer this program as a non-accredited program, meaning it did not go through whatever parameters it would fall under to get that accreditation. Okay. So GPR programs are like mostly accredited. Like this isn't a GPR program. This is a restorative, non-accredited restorative program. It, it clearly states on the website that it is a non-accredited program. And it says, it although this is not a CODA accredited program, some states in the U.S. may allow two-year graduates the opportunity for licensure. Please contact individual state dental boards for, for specific requirements. So it's, it's clearly stated that it is a certificate and it's not CODA accredited. And I guess just to make this perfectly clear, when you go back to reciprocity, uh, and 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 maybe you can help me out a little bit on this. That it 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 does give clarification of what is considered uh, a a a proper school to graduate from to even be apply for reciprocity. Well, the. The requirement is that the states or jurisdictions requirements for a license or certificate are substantially equivalent to or exceed the requirements for um, for getting licensure here. If they've if they're allowing a way in that does not get allowed in in Indiana, then then that is not met. Um, so it really just comes down to whether or not <clears throat> if your reading of the law would allow for licensure of somebody uh, with with the non accredited background. Um, then that would be a different story. If you think that that becomes, if you think an application with that is a non-starter in Indiana, then in reciprocity, it's no better because the fact that they got the license that way it means that that state's or jurisdiction's uh, standards are are inherently different. So, uh, any news on your witness? Uh, he's he's coming. Okay. 
Could, could I add? Yep, you can, sure, you're, you're still on the record. Um, so when I visited the Indiana website, there were three multiple ways of applying for the licensure. There was through examination, there was through reciprocity, and then there was through unaccredited affiliation. I did apply through reciprocity that um, because the requirements that were asked were either or, as what I have over here on the from the PLA website. And when I submitted all the documents that the requirements for the national board exam, the REB, and all the other certification and the licensure of Illinois, that's all that they stated. There was there nowhere on the website is it mentioned that it has to be CODA accredited. If I knew, I would not have applied, um, and it would have saved me 10 months. Any other questions from the board? Sorry about that. So she applied under reciprocity, but there was also an option to test, to test in. Oh, I didn't, hadn't heard of it. So that's why I was asking. Okay. You don't test in. Okay. Good. Thank you. What What's the number of the reciprocity statute? I see 25.1.21.5, and the relevant subsection is uh, 1A. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Could I, could I call him again? Sure. Twenty-five one twenty-one five twenty-five dash one dash twenty-one dash five. See, that's something I'm missing. Twenty-five dash one dash twenty-one. No, twenty-five dash one dash twenty-one. Five. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Five dish one dish I understand two. it can help to have it in front of people, but I can just read the words sure. uh, directly if that would be of service. Um, among the conditions the applicant has to satisfy is that they hold a current license or certificate from another state or jurisdiction and that states or jurisdictions requirements for a license or certificate are substantially equivalent to or exceed the requirements for a license or certificate of the board from which the applicant is seeking licensure or certification. So the initial answer was no, and she was denied on that basis. So we're reconsidering that question now. Yes. Um, I, I understand I was denied based off of A, option A, but right after that, it says or B. So it's either or, A or B, and under B, the requirements that were stated, I have fulfilled those. So I'm I'm a little uh, confused as to is it A and B or is it A or B? Read that section again, Leaf. That dis that describes that we have to be equivalent or uh, a, a reciprocator well, yeah. would have to be equivalent or no, more. And she's questioning B now. Um, and she is correct that if she meets B, then she would qualify for licensure also. So I'll read B for you. Uh, B says. Uh, 
because it says, or when the person was licensed or certified by another state, one, there were minimum education requirements in, in the other state, two, if there were applicable work and experience and clinical supervision requirements in effect, the person met those requirements in order to be licensed or certified in that state, and three, if required by the other state, the person previously passed an examination required for the license of, or certification. So if she can check all those boxes, she is correct that this that she shouldn't be denied on the basis of A. There were issues with those. She did, did the REB. She has an Illinois license. What else did she have to have to qualify? Just making a, a national board. National board. National board REB. Uh, you have an Illinois license active. Yes. No encumbrances. No. 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 What are we missing here? I don't I don't offhand know if we are um, so is there a minimum of time that uh, she needs to have practiced in another state for reciprocity no uh, they, it doesn't it doesn't name any minimum for this so um, so that's not really a, a part of the part of the calculus here um, is uh, that your witness? Yes. Come on up to this uh, table, if you would, sir. <clears throat> Actually, uh, would you state your name? Uh, my name is Zurawar Singh. Zurawar Singh. Okay, Robert Singh. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me come back to this. Um, okay. Uh, please stand, if you will. We're going to swear you in to be a witness. Do you and each of you solemnly swear? Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this cause will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Okay. Be seated. So, just uh, tell us what you'd like to tell us in favor of um, Tranum. Uh, we've been married for three years. Um, um, she's a great dentist, and more than a great dentist, she's a great wife. Um, all the common get-togethers we've been to, um, I've kind of met her patients uh, personally. They all kind of say good things about her and how she kind of is dedicated to her work. Her parents are dentists, um, so she comes from a family of dentists. She had an unfortunate reckless driving incident. I was with her. Um, I don't think it'll ever be repeated again. Uh, she's never had any kind of interactions with the law ever before this incident. And it was just one of those unfortunate things which is never to be repeated again. Okay, thank you. So are we ready to close for deliberation? I, Anybody have anything else? Well, uh, if I could just yeah. get clarification if, um, I, I don't know the answer to this, and maybe everybody else on the board already does, but because she's licensed in Illinois, are there minimum education requirements in that state? What is the answer to that question? Do we ask her? Do we know that answer? We would assume yes. So, so the answer is yes. If there were applicable work experience and clinical supervision, the person met those to be licensed. I guess that's a question to you. Uh, there were no supervision requirements in the state of Illinois, and uh, I started work right away. I've been with the same company for the last two and a half years, and I've never been clinically supervised as it was not a requirement by the state. Of Illinois. Yes. And, and finally, if it was required by the other state, Illinois, um, you previously passed an examination required for license or certification. Was there an examination required yes. in Illinois? Yes, the National Board exam and the Western Regional Examination Board, which I took back in 2019, the licensing examination. Did you pass? Yes, I did. Did you share that documentation yes, with us? I've shared it with the state of Indiana as well. That was one of the requirements in the application for the uh, REB board sends it uh, electronically uh, to the state of Indiana, and so does National Board Dental Examination send the documentation directly electronically to the board. So I had submitted that. Thank you. Cindy, do we have that documentation? 
you are looking. Thank you. Thank you. That was okay. all my questions. Um, one thing that I, um, cause I was a bit thrown by <clears throat> the advent that B might be a potential way in. I will note that 25-1-21-5 does open with the language, notwithstanding any other law subject to section 11 of this chapter, the board shall issue a license or certificate, which made me think, cause I, the specific IC 2514 dental statutes, the notwithstanding other law part is what gives me some pause at this point. Um, 2514.116 does have its own provision saying um, the board may issue a license upon payment of a fee to an applicant who furnishes proof satisfactory. Well, I shouldn't. 2514.116 I see is not. That's that's an applicant by examination. I th that's that's the only hesitation I'm having right now is if there's something in the in the dental code, <clears throat> um, then the notwithstanding other law part. You don't see anything though. I <clears throat> not immediately, but this is kind of a new uh, issue being thrown <laughs> thrown in uh, that I that I didn't spot prior to the proceeding. Um, so. Well, let me see. I just, I, I'm, I'm holding things up on the basis that I don't want to suddenly go into deliberations and then I find something against her that well, she doesn't get the chance to have, get a word in edgewise about. So I don't, I don't want to, you know, close the proceedings and then ambush. What, what he's referring to is if we go into, we will give you an opportunity to make a closing statement and then we'll close the hearing. At that point in time, if we go into deliberation, um, you won't be able to make any more comments. So we're holding that open for a second. I think we're going to find that under the graduates of the non-approved program. Uh, well, there's a statute that speaks to that, but that's for unaccredited uh, schools outside of the country. Yeah, this is she, will, she attended an unaccredited school. Oh, as, as well, unaccredited school outside the country, I thought UCLA? No, no she, bachelor's degree. She's a postgraduate program there. Okay, that's why I had passed over that. The, there was I heard UCLA and Manipal, University, University of Manipal. Yes. Yeah. And cameras request regarding schools. We don't have cameras. Mm -hmm. We don't have any cameras. No, because they're not required for reciprocity. Okay. I thought that was just the the or part of the reciprocity statute, no? Well, the or part of the reciprocity statute is subject to the entire, that entire statute is subject to a notwithstanding other law part. The, the language of 25-1-21-5 says notwithstanding any other law and then lays out the law, which means that it doesn't supersede law, other laws that might come into consideration. Um, so yeah, the, I will say that the unaccredited uh, dental college um, statute does refer to well the passing well because she wouldn't have taken an Indiana exam so it does refer to the five years immediately preceding doctor how long have you been in practice Six and a half years. Okay, so she meets any minimum, so that's that part is not a concern. Um, so my only concern at this point is that twenty five fourteen one sixteen, and the reason that I got thrown off of this before was because the name of the statute starts with applicants for examination but it also semicolon semicolon then it refers to license by reciprocity and it does say uh license is licensed in another state or a province of canada that has licensing requirements substantially equal to those that affect in indiana on the date of application so that 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 part still seems to be a requirement to my reading under 2514.116B, uh, B1. Um, so I, 
I think given that 25-1-21-5 says notwithstanding any other law, and there is another law that says that, I do think that the substantially equivalent requirements, that's my reading of it, is that that's still the dental board specific code. So you're, say, you're saying that because of the, um, more so because of the five year, or the, was that a five year? The, Not the five, yeah, the, the bachelor's time, degree. She meets minimum time. No, no, I'm talking about the uh, bachelor's degree in dentistry. Is that in, in, uh, yeah, the licensing Manipal. requirements are for issuing jurisdiction being not substantially equivalent to Indiana would still be. And so problem. Illinois doesn't do that where we do. Illinois doesn't, um, recognize or, or use for their licensing the, uh, the, uh, uh law that you would basically have to be from a CODA approved school. Apparently, yeah that that is that is my reading because uh, I it, yeah because of the fact that the language of twenty five one twenty one five does concede to other laws that may apply and the dental board specifically has a statute that says that that wasn't repealed at the time that the broader reciprocity statute that applies to all licenses across professions uh, the fact that it's still sitting there means that. I think that it applies to this. Uh, Cindy, can I just ask you, 2514-116 is still something that the board staff looks at when processing these applications, correct? Yeah. Including reciprocity applications. Yeah. So. And that's that would be the CODA approved school in part. Yeah. Okay. So it still comes back to if the board thinks that the, the requirements are substantially equivalent in the issuing jurisdiction. I, I think that still is an issue. She has to do yes. Um, so on the, uh, I just want bringing this up for some clarification on the Indiana Professional Licensing Agency for the application checklist. Um, there were three categories through examination, reciprocity, and unaccredited school. Even under unaccredited school, all they require is transcripts from a two-year program. Nowhere on the website is CODA accredited mentioned. Um, that's the only thing that I wanted clarification on because if the website mentioned CODA accreditation, the application would have never been submitted on my behalf. So because on the website, it clearly states all it requires is transcripts from a two-year program, which I have. I did a two-year program at UCLA School of Dentistry. And I, the program was eligible to sit for the licensing board examination, which I know a lot of non-accredited programs do not allow for you to sit for the licensing board exam since they're not CODA accredited, but the restorative program did have that uh, special feature when at the time of application, which I knew of that I can sit for the board exam in case I wanted to practice dentistry in the United States. I do think she's actually right about because the substantially equivalent, well, I guess if, if the, technically it's true that if the other jurisdiction doesn't have substantially equivalent requirements, then it doesn't necessarily apply in the same way. But it's, it does seem like a fair common sense reading that if she has a qualifying background, despite the college being unaccredited, that, that it would be proper to license at that point. Uh, because the substantial requirements test still relies upon the notion that you shouldn't let people have a license here just on the basis that somebody with with lesser standards let her in. And, and if she's meeting the requirements of Indiana too, I, I don't know. So I, I I just wanted to credit what she's saying there. I don't see anything under 251414.5, which is what refers to unaccredited dental college applicants. I don't see anything that would necessarily have prevented her licensure on that basis if this was a if this was not a reciprocity examination or a reciprocity application. Um, anybody else questions before we close the hearing? Okay. Um, and and I, as we discussed a minute or two ago, the uh, um, when we close the hearing, then you won't have any more comments. So if you have any closing statements, anything else you'd like to say before we close the hearing and we'll deliberate and then have an answer for you. Um, uh, all 
I'd like to add is that um, I've always been an honest and ethical practitioner. Um, I like to believe that I try to serve the community at my best capacity. So at the end of the day, I just would like the board to see that, that I have passed standardized national examination of United States of America to be practicing here. And at the time of my application, that's all that I was looking at. So I hope you'd look at the same. Ma'am, right before we, we go off the record here, I did just want to clarify one thing. It's it's apart from what we've been talking about, but since there's a range of options here, if they if this goes your way, um, the criminal case has is there any criminal probation outstanding or anything like no. that? No. Okay. I just wanted to make sure in case you go the probationary license route that we had that information. So. Yeah, I have another question. Go for it. I'm sorry. Uh, on that note, um, it said that it has 12 months until February of 25. I have year. I have completed all the requirements that the court asked. Yes. Uh, it started in February, and all three requirements have been met. And um, it was under court supervision. I was not convicted. It was a reckless charge, and reckless driving is not considered a conviction in the state of Illinois. And uh, I was advised, I mean, asked for court supervision, three requirements, all three have been fulfilled. My uh, lawyer that was representing me at the time, John W. Callahan, he, uh, sub I submitted his letter that, uh, to the board. Uh, I, I don't know if that is, so, if you're able to view that, where um, he states the same. So there is, there is a difference between meeting all the requirements of probation and uh, the probation being discharged. Cause I mean, cause yeah. technically you would not have necessarily met the time requirement. Yeah. Even if the other active requirements yeah. uh, had been met. So are you saying that at some point the court issued an order discharging the probation? No, not yet. So it's not yeah. technically a probation it's court supervision. So there's some requirements. So in February is when the court will do the final hearing because it has some continuous monitoring, so it's not a probation, it's just a court supervision. Okay. That, that, that is correct. I mean, it, it says court supervision for 12 months, which would end in 12, February of 2025. Um, and, I mean, it gives all the, you know, the, the final sentence order says all of that stuff. So the court supervision will not end until then. And so, is that correct? The court supervision is ongoing? Yes. Okay. Okay. Last chance. Okay. Um, so, no other closing statement? You're good? Yes. Okay. Um, these proceedings, according to notice, are hereby concluded. This cause is therefore ad adjourned until further order. Thank you all for coming. Okay. So we're set for some discussion on this. Definitely been a tough one to look at. Um, what you thinking, Darren? I want to make a motion to grant licensing. Okay. So and okay, so Darren made a motion to grant licensure, and I have a second from Dr. Wells. Okay, so let's discuss this. Um, one one caveat would be, and I'm not not speaking against this, one caveat is we need to figure out the reckless driving paperwork dates and the order and all that. Uh, how do we do that? I mean, yeah, it, she's correct that uh, it, the term is in Illinois as court supervision rather than probation. I think it's a, probably kind of a distinction without a difference. That's what probation is here too. Don't don't mess up and everything's okay after a certain period of time, um, whatever name you want to call it by. So um, it looks like, because of February 15th, 2024, uh, 12 months was the sentence on that. So we're about halfway through that. Um, so what would you recommend doing with that? You know, I don't. Would you delay? I don't know if the board, I don't know if the board has a strong precedent as to um, necessarily putting somebody on probation uh if they still have if they, they still have the ongoing criminal probation if it's a short enough period of time that's really a discretionary call for the board certainly somebody with a criminal conviction 
you have full standing to issue it on probation instead of free and clear, but you don't have to. Is it, is it an option to offer free and clear, a free and clear unencumbered license after February, whatever that date was? No, you, you would have to, and it, I mean, it, I, I think you'd have to act on the application and I think you would have to issue it as, um, issue as, as a probationary license if you wanted to apply probation at all. And it, you know, ultimately, obviously you want for one thing to be consistent with precedent yeah. and, uh, yeah. but beyond that, you also want to consider the central question of does this practitioner, are you concerned with this person practicing without any oversight of the board? Cause it, there's that too. Um, that ultimately is the whole reason for probation is not, it's not to be punitive, but rather to make sure that the public is protected. So does the public need to be protected from this person? That is, that's a discretionary call for the board. Um, but, but the, the precedent is also important. And, uh, I don't have, I don't have strong feelings that I've seen exactly alike cases to this, uh, that the board has a really consistent precedent on. So I'm not going to throw up any precedent flags, whatever you decide, I guess okay. is my stance. We're still motion a second. We're still under discussion. And as of right now, the motion is just grant the license. Yeah. And it doesn't say anything about probation. Annette. I just need clarification. I'm confused. Um, I thought, according to us that we don't grant licensure if they didn't graduate from a CODA approved school. And then obviously Illinois had different standards. So again, in the terminology where it said that our educational levels are the same for Indiana and Illinois, obviously they're not similar. so or similar. But again, obviously, like as it was discussed before, Illinois must grant and not, it doesn't matter if they're not CODA approved, but I thought ours are. So again, I don't know how we can grant a license if our stipulations are she has to have graduated from a CODA approved school and both her original dental license and the program she took in California, both of those were non CODA approved. So that's already in our statute. Um, so, other discussion so, addressing that? Yeah, I, uh, to address her point exactly, I've got the statute pulled up here. It reads, they must complete a two-year program, submit the official transcript. Uh, the two-year program is uh, to be advanced education and a general dentistry program from a accredited institution. But it does not say accredited program. It says from an accredited institution. She took the program at an accredited institution. It doesn't say that the program has to be accredited. Right. Right. The institution they take it at has to be. So in my mind, with my reading, it meets all those status, uh, you know, the requirements because it was a two-year program at an accredited UCLA dental school. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, other discussion? <clears throat> Are we mixing words? I mean, you know, uh, uh, Twyla had had mentioned that you know each program has to be accredited. Is that, that's not the way our that, statute reads. Not the way I understand. I, I understand that, but I, I'm kind of curious on your take, uh, Twyla and Jeff. You 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 you're 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 in and and, and even Dr. Ward. Uh, you were in the educational field. What's your take on that? Can I have a minute? <laughs> you got it. <laughs> yes, yes. So, yeah, I mean, while she's... She'll, she'll say, Yeah. So while uh, while Twyla's taking a look, I I do support uh, Dr. Kolkman's. I, I understand. Uh, I understand what <laughs> what seems like mincing words. Obviously, I'm biased because I'm a lawyer, and that's what we do. Uh, but that. But I also think that a body, that, you know, administering the law is that's that's the responsibility as well. Uh, if the statute says something, um, you know, if the letter of the law is clear enough, then the spirit of the law loses, I, I think. So I, I think if the letter of the law is abundantly clear and it does say institution, I, if yeah, I mean, I'd have to what agree the legislators with land on. I think that's what it is. That's what the statute says. Either of you two guys like to comment 
where you've been at the school and that? Um, I would agree with Darren uh, that she's been practicing for six and a half years. She did pass a licensing examination that would have qualified her uh, through Epperson today to be within the state of Indiana for licensure had satisfied Illinois. I agree with everything you say, and I agree with what your wording is on the statute. And I understand from the legal perspective, it's mincing words, but it's just the spirit of the law. So I would agree with Darren and Crunchy on this one. Jeff, anything? I would probably, I would, I would, I guess I would concur. I think we're kind of, like we said, we're in the weeds a little bit because one definition we have as educators doesn't actually uh, go along with what the state statute is. Yeah. And obviously, I think we're here to support the statute. Tamara, anything on that? I would support licensure for this dentist in the state of Indiana. Um, who haven't we? Um, Ed, what are your thoughts on that? When she said her graduation, I'm trying to figure out uh, being six and a half years. I was trying to figure out if that was all in Illinois or if that was since she's started in UCLA or was it back in India. So she got her DMD and, and excuse me. She, she Bachelor of Dental Science in 2016. Um, from Manipal, UCLA, she got her graduation date in 2019. That's that was um, exactly like five years, two months, um, and then I I can't see like to me it looks like her license started in in three of 22 in Illinois from everything I see. So that's two years. Yeah, not not six and a half years in the state. That's what I'm trying to get at. The other was previous. Um, That's what I'm trying to figure out. India. Yeah. yeah. 22, yeah. You think? Well, yeah. Can we just call the question? Well, I see. I do see the Illinois, I mean, I've seen the same thing. The Illinois, I just looked up the Illinois license. It was issued in 2022. Uh, the unaccredited dental college, it does say, <clears throat> must satisfy possessing a license in good standing from another state and be legally engaged in the practice of dentistry in the other state for the five years immediately preceding the application. So may have thrown something into the spokes there of the wheel. Um, I. <clears throat> Because the other the other statute twenty five fourteen one sixteen reciprocity requirement refers to that just refers to practicing dentistry for at least two of the three years preceding the date of the application. So we're we're kind of trying to thread a needle here. She's good. She's got she meets that one. Um, the other one is the requirement for an unaccredited uh, unaccredited dental college. Um, and you would have practiced dentistry there. Yeah. So that, that five-year thing does come in as a result of an application that you were otherwise seeing directly for non-reciprocity licensure here. So that's when that five years comes in. I, I don't necessarily think that that makes it clear that the five years has to be met, but it's, it's not an unfair thing to have brought up. All right. Can I just have Matt read that statute one more time? Go for it, Matt. Uh, the institution. Uh, clinical training program applicants must have successfully completed a clinical training program of at least two years and submit an official transcript. The applicant must show completion of, and then in her case, it's advanced education and general dentistry program from an accredited institution. So my point was it doesn't say an accredited program. It says a two-year advanced education program from an accredited institution. She did a two-year program 
at UCLA, which is an accredited institution. That's reciprocity. Well, I see where where it reads that way in the statute. My only concern is what if we do do this, what happens down the road? Does this open up something that? Well, I think each case like this is just it's just complicated. I'm I'm confused. Back on the five year mark, excuse me, for reciprocity. Do you have to have Timed a up. license for that five year period prior to reciprocity? Well, that's my confusion. That's you the have... endorsement law, right? That's not the reciprocity law. That's the endorsement law. <clears throat> it's now a, we're but, really getting into the weeds, but because that's a license in good standing from another state and be legally engaged in the practice of dentistry in the other state for the five years. So now, it, that now that's that raises a concern. Yes. Yeah, because I looking at that again in my experience past, it meant having an active license for five years practicing good standing without anything going on for their reciprocity to take effect. And now my question is, has she had a license, a license in good standing for those five for five? Well, years she period? hasn't. She's she's had the license uh, in what appears to be good standing for two and a half years. Um, a little bit less than two and a half years, but more than two, which meets the 2514-116 reciprocity minimum, which is has practiced dentistry for at least two of the three years preceding the date of the application. The five-year thing is being brought in because that governs uh, licensure for uh, licensure requirements for person coming from an un unaccredited dental college. That's that's another statute. Um, essentially, I think the theory has been here that even if you can find, because it, it also has the licensing requirements must be substantially equal to those in effect in Indiana. Um, my reading has been if she could get a license here uh, under the other standards, then regardless of any inequality in the in the requirements between Indiana, Indiana and Illinois, um, should they necessarily prevent licensure here? Um, right. the reciprocity statute says the two years is enough. It's, it's the other one that says five years and that's on, it kind of just depends on how you read it. If you read it as though that's dispositive, that's, that's not the application that's in front of you, but you're looking at that as when you're measuring the, uh, element of substantially equal to the requirements. Okay. Let's do a head count on this. Um, you want to start and we'll go around the room signify if you support the motion signify by saying aye and raising your hand just aye. one at a time aye ed nay okay annette aye nay Aye. 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 Yeah. That's the majority by oh. one. Is that right? I think it was six five. Six. Yeah. Is that what you get? Five. Okay. All right, it was um, a six to five vote. It's the majority to um, grant you a license in the state of Indiana. Thank you. You you heard a couple of these concerns. One of which is um, the uh, reckless driving charge, which may may have been a DUI, but anyway, whatever. With that, um, we certainly don't want to see anything like that going on ever, but certainly not before February. Um, yes. She was granted a license at that screening period and now she's still. We, we, that was we what voted. The motion was that That's the way the motion was made. Yeah. Which is a little outside of what we normally do. So just don't be doing anything silly driving or whatnot. So um, the, uh, will she get the, 
Because I have to, I do, I definitely have to draft an order that reverses a prior decision. Will she have to wait on that order before she gets the license? Okay. You will also also be sent uh, the Indiana law exam, which you will complete online, <laughs> uh, and that that gets to you pretty quickly. Um, anything I've forgotten, guys? Um, congratulations. Okay. And take that guy with you. I don't think he's a biased, unbiased witness. Thank you so much for your consideration. I, tr it, it truly means a lot that there was an open discussion regarding this. And I can assure you that you'll never be hearing anything against me ever again. Well, hopefully just your relicensure. <laughs> That's the thing. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Where are we? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, looks like we're on personal appearances. We have a Dr. Helbert, is it Helbert? Helbert? Helfert, my, excuse me, Dr. Helfert. Oh, he's online, okay. Oh, okay. Um, Dr. Helford, if you can unmute your mic or the mic on your laptop. Can you hear me now? Yep. Good morning. Good morning. Let's let me get situated from all that. Um, my laptop blew up yesterday afternoon this this is a borrowed laptop like a i guess i'm trying to not work it like a borrowed mule or whatever but <laughs> application Okay, um, everybody pretty much found everything there. I haven't quite, but I'll, I'll go ahead and run off my notes a minute. Uh, so Dr. Helfert, you're attending this meeting today to um, request a mobile dental uh, application or a, an application for a mobile dental license. Um, you wanna just um, tell us about this? Yes, sir. Uh, I have Dr. Jeff Johnson with me and uh, Mr. Jordan Smith of Jet Dental. And the plan is to provide mobile dentistry to businesses. I currently work in mobile dentistry with Big Smiles, uh, working with children in schools, and with Aria, uh, a company that works with seniors in nursing homes. And this opportunity came across um, my desk earlier in the year or late last year uh, from uh, the CEO of Big Smiles, Mr. Steve Higginbotham. He introduced me to uh, Jeff Smith, the CEO of Jet Dental, and it just seems like a good relationship and a great opportunity to offer primarily preventive dentist and our uh, dentistry to people in their place of employment and then have an MOA with local dentists to provide um, anything that gets into serious dentistry. Okay, thank you. Um, a few months ago when we talked to representatives from Jet Dental, um, we had some concerns and I need to just stop and ask our legal um, person over here. Leif, that was referred, they were referred to the Attorney General's office to look into practicing dentistry without a license. So we wouldn't know where that is at this point in time. Correct. Uh, yeah, if you <clears throat> if you if the board has uh, filed a consumer complaint with the OAG, you wouldn't know anything unless something has been filed, unless an action has been initiated. Okay, so I guess what I'm <clears throat> the reason I'm discussing this with the board is that 
there may or may not be something going on with that with the parent company Jet Dental. So I guess we're just um, basically today reviewing Dr. Helfert's uh, application. Would it so be questions. best to wait to see? And that, that's if, and if that, that's what, that's what I'm that that's kind of what up. I'm asking too. I I don't I don't know that question the answer to that question. Well, obviously they can't talk about it, so we know that yeah. um, anything that's under investigation they can't yeah. say whether they're looking into it more or anything like or that. Not. It, or, or not. Correct. They they can't. But when did we file it? Do you recall, um, Chairman? Was that that was before? That must have been the first meeting of the year. Maybe maybe that was February. So yeah. if I looked at the notes properly, aren't they doing like seven, nine months on investigations? Isn't that what the AG's report says later on today? So we're not yet, you know, at the part where they're closing it. Um, I would not feel comfortable making a decision on this mobile dentist today if within three months, the inspector gen or the attorney general's office comes in and tells us they were practicing dentists without a license. I think I need some clarity here on the, the connection between Dr. Um, and uh, He's, he's going to be working with jet dental jet dental was the, uh, had originally applied for a mobile dental license. Yeah. We, okay. we denied that. And then we referred, um, uh, we sent that request to look, look at uh, the, the angle that perhaps they were uh, practicing dentistry in the state of Indiana without an Indiana license at that point in time. Yeah. Um, and then this, this fellow is on his uh, own with Jet Dental in the background. Um, so, okay. We're governed here by physical requirements for mobile dental facilities as placed uh, in, the, in the administrative rules. It was appropriate to act in one way with jet dental that might not be here because part of what part of one of the considerations uh of processing a license is if the applicant uh practiced unlicensed unlawfully up to that point um so i don't know i i guess <clears throat> this is an initial application for licensure so it doesn't face the same sort of um statutory limit on delay that reinstatement and and uh renewal do but um holding it up on this adjacent basis i guess i'm trying to get my mind to where <clears throat> to where that actually becomes appropriate i understand the concern um is it essentially a situation where the physical requirements that he is proposing that he would meet are also being or, or is it basically one and the same because he's going to be working with them or dr helford does that help us with that your physical the physical office would be an office of yours or it would be um, with Jet Dental? No, that's a good question. I no longer have a physical office. I um, would let me let me help you a little bit. Sure. I looked up a, an address of 838 Delaware Street or Delaware Suite E number 2037. Um, is that is that something you would be involved with or Jet Dental would be involved with? Uh, you know, maybe Jordan can answer that. That might be uh, yeah. Jet Dental's Indiana headquarters location. Yeah, Jet Dental does not operate any brick and mortar practices. Um, so we do not have any brick and mortar practices in the state. We have a mailing address in the state. Uh, we use um, MOAs to refer patients to local practices in the area. So we provide primarily preventive services for the, the patients that we serve um, when we're on side of the business. And then okay, any well, further treatment that they need, we refer back to local practices. Okay, well, who's, who's Nomad is registered at 100 Southeast LaSalle Avenue, Suite 1A in South Bend. Dr. Helford, that is was, that yours? That, that is not mine. So... In terms of physical requirements, the, I'm not sure what that is. The in terms of there being a brick and mortar facility, I don't know that that really matters. When we're talking about physical requirements for a mobile dental facility, it's for the unit itself that would go around practicing, like facilitating the practice of dentistry. Um, 
So surely there is some sort of physical structure. That's yeah, where would those guys go when you're, when they're whatever, winterized or they're just yeah, sitting? So typic yeah, so typically, um, so we do pop-up dentistry. So um, we bring the equipment into a space, like into a spare conference room or training room. Um, and so we do have a nomad that we utilize. Um, and so we have, a, we do not have a, a physical team in Indiana. Obviously the hope is eventually to have, have someone there in, in Indiana physically. Um, we have a team in Illinois that could travel and cover Indiana events at this point. Um, the Illinois team has, uh, we have a storage, we have a couple of storage units. We have a temperature controlled storage unit for anything that needs to be temperature controlled. Uh, temperature controlled and then we have a storage unit that's just specifically for the sprinter van that we transport equipment in is there the whatever the mobile dental facility that you would be moving around is does is that independent from the ownership of jet dental or um is it, i guess is there a common ownership interest in the facility itself at all um, that's a good question. I'd have to, I'd have to maybe think about, I, I mean, I think Jet Dental owns the, owns the equipment and the facilities. Um, uh, you know, we, we own all the equipment and we own the Sprinter van. And again, we don't do anything in a van itself. No one comes into a van or comes into a trailer to get services. We're going into a space and, and the van just transports the equipment. So, um, but the van uh, and the equipment for that van, that's all on a lease uh, that's through Jet Dental. So I guess I, where I begin to come down on this is that uh, obviously if this was, if this essentially acted as a workaround that gave Jet Dental uh, a license, uh, in another way, I understand putting it off. Uh, otherwise, I think that it would have to be processed independently. I, I think in terms of a consumer complaint going out and not knowing what the status of it is, I don't know that we ever necessarily learn the status. Cindy, you don't get the closing letters that say they've closed an investigation with no further action. Is that right? So it's a thing where you may or may not know. Now, I'm guessing on request, you could get a, a specific update as the complainant. But otherwise, I don't know that um, I don't know that it could ever be ruled out. So it, let's put it this way, an indefinite delay should not be truly permanent, which it can be. Um, so I, I would just have my misgivings about uh, this, unless it basically is another way of a jet dental applying. <laughs> In, in the meantime. So I, I think you have to parse whether or not this needs to be treated independently or not, because. Well, I guess the caveat is that all of the, all of these, whatever pre-printed forms and um, operating procedures and all that are from Jet Dental. Um, when you look back through those. I, Dr. Helfert, um, Edward Hammonds here. Do you have a contract with Jet Dental yourself? Uh, hello, Edward. Uh, I do not currently, and if I can make a statement about what uh, the other dentist said, now I absolutely don't want to do anything that's unethical or illegal or immoral, and um, have no intention to to create some kind of workaround for Jet Dental. With that said, I do plan to be the primary dentist working here in Indiana, and I would not be using this mobile dentistry license at least in this at this point for anything other than to work with Jet Dental. So if you saw that as a problem, I would certainly understand the desire to wait and see also. As, as I understand what happened with Jet in the past, and you may know this better than I do, they had, and Jordan, correct me if I'm wrong, but they had a team or teams working here in Indiana with licensed dentists, but didn't realize they needed a separate mobile dental license. And so when they were uh, presented with that by the board, they they stop practicing, and, I'm, and of course, I'm not familiar with what's going on beyond that either. I think they believe that the case is closed at this point, if I'm not wrong, Jordan. Yeah, I'm unaware of the case, but that's correct. Um, we had a uh, licensed dentist working. Um, we did not have a mobile license. We had a previous outside dental counsel 
uh, that we felt was not being very responsive. We hired a new council and they made us aware of that requirement, that statute. Uh, we immediately ceased all operations and then began ap applying for the, the, of course, the mobile uh, license. And this is our, our third meeting. Now um, we, we hired or not hired, we've been talking with Dr. Hel Helfert and I think pending your approval of the mobile license would enter then into a contract with Dr. Helfert. But at this point we were trying to have a, um, you know, obviously wanted to get the mobile license first. Obviously if that were denied, uh, we will continue to not have operations in the state of Indiana. Um, I think I, I did just want to clarify that I think sometimes there's a misnomer that perhaps we're taking business from local dentists. And I, I think that's just factually incorrect. The average patient we see hasn't been to the dentist in well over three years. And so, uh, we actually increase business for local dentists um, and we get people back into the dental system um, by making it convenient for them. Dr. Helfert um, was referred to us and, and is a, uh, from all, all accounts that we've seen a great dentist. And so we wanted to work with him as our, um, as the, as the head dentist in, in the area in, in, in a cooperate, you know, cooperation with us and working with Jet Dental. So um, again, that's, that's what we're, we're here to do today. And we're obviously just here to provide support to, to Dr. Helfer, but, um, that's, that's, that's correct. Other discussion board members. I, I think just to add more on the, <clears throat> on the potential of an OAG action, if they were going to bring, if it was about unlicensed practice, I do think it's important that the board is aware of the scope of that. The, unless there has been financial damage done by unlicensed practice, the only remedy with an unlicensed practice action is a order that formally says, stop doing this, stop practicing unlicensed, which of course becomes moot the second they get licensed anyway. So part of this is, I, I don't know that there's actually that much to adjudicate because they're openly admitting that they did things wrong and that they're trying to do things right now. Um, so even in the absence of a formal judgment through an OAG action, I think you already have the element there. They have practiced illegally in the past, which is not a bar to being licensed, but it is something that creates a basis on which the, the board can uh, deny. I, I don't know that the waiting on that action makes any sense, given that there don't seem to be any facts in dispute. It seems to be an agreed upon thing that Jet Dental had people practicing uh, unlicensed and and so it made sense to deny that application. This application is from somebody associated with somebody who has done that. So I, I don't. So he hasn't practiced unlicensed to our knowledge. Uh, he he isn't guilty of these things. Uh, if Jet Dental was, is the board's attitude that it's simply never going to license them? Uh, I I don't know. I I guess. I guess that would be it. I, I don't know that it necessarily makes sense to, to delay based on OAG action since nothing punitive can happen unless they actually have caused financial damage of their practice. Other discussion? In my notes, I had that they were, these were not licensed dentists. <clears throat> yeah, they did not have Indiana dental license. That's what the problem was. That's what I have in my notes now. I'm still there. So mm -hmm. I kind of wanted to clarify that. So now uh they're bringing... Uh, Indiana, he's, he has an Indiana license, he's overseas, and work with other Indiana licensed dentists. Yeah, I think I think that was one of the issues, of course, where they were recruiting hygienists for Muncie or someplace, and they didn't have a license. There were some issues like that at the time. Um, I guess one of my one of my concerns is um, no brick and mortar in Indiana, but apparently we don't have to. I mean, where do, what do you do with the um, merchants? The metal, the uh, you know, uh, EMRs are just floating around in the cloud or something. I I don't know. Also, isn't my recollection there has to be a place right. where patients can go if there is a problem well, after a procedure. I think they have they have that covered in here in their operating procedure. I, I think most of that stuff's been you know. Um, tightened up and all well it does say the operator of a mobile dental facility this is under a28 ic 4832 uh operator of a mobile dental facility or portable dental operation shall maintain an official business or mailing address of record uh which shall not be a post office box so they can't it, so there has to be something there has to be some so sort of something that's kind of what i'm looking for um dr helfert the one that was connected with you is like 
looks like it was a strip mall with, I don't know, um, I couldn't zoom in on suite E number 2037. Uh, and then, um, you yeah, know, it's, it's the... definitely not a dental practice. I mean, it, it's not a dental practice. There's there's no ifs, ands, or buts about this. It's technically not a post office box, but it's uh, essentially like a UPS store, you know, where they have just mailboxes. So it's it's essentially the same thing. So it's 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 a mailing address. It's it's a place to get mail. It's not a place where you could see patients or serve patients. So I do want to be clear about that. I did also want to clarify um, the few times we did do anything in Indiana, we always had a licensed dentist and licensed hygienist. So I'm not sure why I was not on any previous proceedings, obviously, but that uh, that's not the case. Uh, the only thing we did not have was the mobile license. And again, once we became aware of that, we ceased operations immediately uh, and began applying for that mobile license. So um, again, the, the statutes are what they are, right? If you're saying, hey, we need to have a physical brick and mortar presence in store, that that's fine. It sounds like we don't meet that. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, but I did want to state my position uh, on that. There, there was never any use of non-licensed Indiana dentists or non-licensed Indiana hygienists. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't, I, at least I don't see anything that specifically says physical location. I mean, this, the, it says official business, which shall not be a post office box, which usually would be a, a place of business. But um, it doesn't, if it doesn't explicitly say that, and if they've accounted for the possibility of, you know, follow up patients having complications, things like that, I'm not sure that that's, I'm not sure that a requirement is being missed that way. Okay. Any board members? Do you see um, anything on this operating procedure? Looks like they have it spelled out pretty well. Um, I don't see any big red flags on that. Uh, medical history and all. Dr. Helfert's driver's license there and all that. Anybody see anything? Doctor, may I say something real quickly? Sure. So uh, I'm, a, I'm an Indiana dentist in good standing. And the last thing I want to do is create a situation that looks bad or smells bad. So if you all look at this and say, this isn't the way it's meant to go down, then we're all okay with that. But I, I'm looking for more work to do. And these guys seem to have a great practice. It sounds like they made some mistakes in the past. And I understood that coming in. And hopefully what we're doing here can rectify that. If we need some kind of brick and mortar location, then maybe that's something we can talk about. But certainly when it comes to the dental treatment beyond primarily preventive stuff, we're, we're going to use local dentists near the, the facilities where we're seeing people. So and, uh, and, and I think I, also the plan too is we, we would like obviously Dr. Helfer to work a lot of these events, right. Um, as our, as our head dentist in the area. And um, that was part of our, our conversation is we believe we have a, a lot of opportunity that we could, we could create there. Um, and, and I, I, again, I just agree with what Dr. Helfer said that, you know, um, we, we want to do whatever is, is best for, for the patients and for, um, the, the people there in Indiana to help them and to give them better dentistry. Our, our mission is to make it easy to have great oral health. Um, but, uh, certainly we want to make sure that we're following all the requirements and, and make sure that we're doing it, uh, as you see fit. So this license would be, <clears throat> mobile license would be in Dr. Helfert's name. That's what I'm seeing, right? Okay. So comments, questions? Yes. So is it safe to assume that since this mobile license will be in Dr. Helfert's name, that he'll be present physically for all of these events? Because for hygienists to be working on patients that don't qualify for prescriptive care, there has to be a licensed dentist on premises. Yeah, I guess that's a good question we were going to ask you is, so there will always be a licensed dentist on site. Um, I think the question uh, maybe we have is uh, that I would ask as a follow up, if Dr. Helford is the, the license is licensed, can we hire other uh, local dentists underneath him? I think certainly Dr. The plan was if we were to start practicing uh, in your state that Dr. Helford would work as many as possible, but there may be uh, 
more remote locations that would be difficult for him to go to that we would hire associate dentists? What, what, uh, well, I would think Dr. Helfer, Dr. Helfer can control that. I am not sure that under this jet dental has, um, would have dealings with that. Would they, Leif, the way this is situated? Well, it's a, see, it's a business application because, uh, Don Helford DDS LLC. So it's a sole proprietorship. What it looks like, uh, now it, it, I guess it's not a sole proprietorship if he's saying that he wouldn't necessarily be on site for all of it. I guess that it's a fair question. Uh, it, cause the, the, the business name creates the appearance of a sole proprietorship, but his answer just now, uh, makes it calls that into question. Uh, so Dr. Helford, I, I guess, I guess that's the question. It, it, it's not a sole proprietorship? No, not at all. In fact, um, you know, I'm certainly not an attorney and I don't understand a lot of the administrative things. I just want to be the dentist providing excellent dentistry. So Jet set up the things that we needed for this, whatever you call it, reciprocal re relationship that DSOs have with dentists. And I plan to be the dentist going to every event that I can but as Jordan said, I live near Indianapolis. I probably won't go to Evansville and, and events like that. Jet has an interesting problem in that most of the customers they did work with during that short stint keep contacting them and saying, when are you going to come back to Indiana? So, um, I, and I think there's several of them throughout the state. So uh, I, I just want to be absolutely upfront, full disclosure, so there's no questions that you know this is a, a dso type relationship and i'm the the i'll be the primary dentist in the state but jet at least as i understand it will be involved with most of the administration of it if that's legal and acceptable if it's not then then this probably isn't something that we should do because i i'm not going to be uh you know, i'm not the ceo of this thing i'm a dentist so, doctor so just want to be very clear that you know we're that there's i don't want it to look funny or anything like that um 828 iac 437 licensed dentist in charge the, the mobile dental facility shall at all times be uh in the charge of a dentist licensed to practice dentistry in indiana the dentist licensed to practice dentistry in indiana shall be present at all times the clinical services are rendered um so the the facility shall be, shall at all times be in the charge of a dentist licensed to practice you're saying there are other like other licensed dentists working for your LLC? There, there, there are will, not. We, there will be no licensed dentists working for the LLC that they file. I, and Jordan, I don't know how that's going to be arranged, but I, I wasn't. Yeah, the, the, the reality is we're talking in generalities of what might be in the future. Um, none of none of this exists currently, right? <laughs> we're not we're not operating in the state. Um, but I think what we were saying is we had contemplated just in talking. You know, Doctor Helfert wants to work. Um, most of these opportunities that we have. Um, and I think if you're saying, hey, it has to be Dr. Helfert and only Dr. Helfert, that's fine. Obviously, we would just work around Dr. Helfert's schedule. We talked about there are uh, remote opportunities and we have these folks and these opportunities that come up. We have dental insurers, for example, who refer business to us, um, us meaning Jet Dental and saying, hey, is, is this an area you can help? And right now we're turning away all opportunities in Indiana. So we talked about, hey, potentially we could help identify other dentists um, who would work un underneath your pur your purview, Dr. Helfert, and with your approval, um, and they would be on site at that event. But Dr. Helfert himself would not be on site at that event. Yeah, and for what it's worth, it's not well, my stance that it would necessarily have to be him based on what the what the 828 IC 437 says. I'm sorry, Tamara, I, I jumped in and it I'll looked like it. you had your hand up. Yeah. Um, but you hit exactly where I was going. Um, the administrative rule doesn't specifically say it has to be one ent one dentist. It just says, and you read it, that a dentist has to be there, which of course, um, Twyla mentioned earlier. So, it, it, this dentist doesn't need to be at every single place. And I think that's their whole operation that, and they, as they move around, they have a dentist who's local there that they bring the mobile place to, and they use local facilities. It's not happening in the van like that other um, mobile dentistry license that we approved, I believe last meeting. 
So this is a different form, I guess, of the mobile dentistry. But the way I read this administrative rule is that it can be any dentist that's licensed in the state of Indiana present at the facility where the dentistry is taking place. But, but it would be my understanding that they would be under Dr. Helfert. Well, it doesn't sound like that's their business model, though. If he, he isn't, it, Jet Dental appears to be a nationwide operation, a, a corporate handling other things. And, and perhaps Jordan can correct me if I'm wrong, that doesn't seem to be their business model, where perhaps one dentist would open up multiple dentist's office in the state of Indiana. This is a corporate model licensed, it looks like registered in Utah, um, whereby it handles mobile dentistry across the state. We're one of the states that doesn't have it. I looked at their map today. Um, but the people who run or plan to run Jet Dental in Indiana can be more clear, but that's the way it looks to me based on what I heard the December meeting when we heard other testimony um, and, and whatever the history is with the Jet Dental coming before the dentistry board, that's my understanding of it. They do not plan to have a, a one single dentist across the state of Indiana that will be like a managing dentist, I guess. Yeah. So yeah. typically we have one, uh, so we that's correct, we're nationwide. Um, we're set up as a DSO and typically in every state that we're in, we have um, one dentist who uh, is our, our head dentist and the PC owner dentist. Um, we are we have not entered into those contracts with Dr. Helfert yet, but that would be the proposal. And I think again, Dr. Helfert, um, you know, wanted to be very clear about the relationship with Jet Dental. Uh, we didn't want uh, again. We just wanted that to be very clear and very upfront. And uh, again, I think we wanted you to have all of the information um on granting that mobile license so uh the entity itself is is uh dr health in dr helfert's name and and he is the pc owner of that entity so each each uh state there's typically a head dentist but then we hire multiple dentists typically within that state to work and and i think you said it well typically we're trying to find local dentists if possible to work those events go forward Ed. um my question goes back to semantics probably. And um, I believe this this permit should be um, applied from by Jet Dental um, instead of Don Helfer. Don Helfer could be the owner in Indiana, but the, everything is coming from Jet Dental and Jet Dental will have other dentists underneath besides Don. Um, in my respect, I think that would be more appropriate. Other discussion or comments? I still think there has to be an actual basis to deny the application. I mean, if they, if you're, if that's the direction that you're wanting to go with it, the, the licensed dentist in charge, I think it's clear. It says the, the facility must always be in charge of a licensed dentist and a licensed dentist must always be there with the patient, but that doesn't preclude. Uh, but Dr. Helford's applying for this. But then we hear all this other stuff in the background that we're going to do this, we're going to do that. That's His business is... Yeah, but the facility itself is not his. I mean, and the direction's not his as far as... So in that respect, I think it's... Everything's being guided by Jet Dental. I think the permit should be applied by them, in my opinion. But it doesn't. It doesn't change what we have to vote on today. I understand that. I think one of the the um, purveying feelings we that at least that was communicated to me. I was not on that call, but that was communicated to me was that um, there was very there was a lot of concern from the board about not having a local dentist that we were working with. And I think that's the approach we're trying to take here is we have found someone who's very interested in working with us and helping these patients who, who need help. They, they aren't going to the dentist uh, until we are able to make it convenient for them. And so I think we're trying to take a more localized, having someone local that is, is there and can help um, actually be on site with, with our patients. Um, and uh, that's, that's the approach that we took. 
Now, we also wanted to make clear that there is a relationship here with Jet Dental, and we're not trying to pull the wool over anyone's eyes about that. I think, obviously, hopefully that's clear today. Um, so, again, I think, um, you know, we're not operating in the state. We won't operate in the state unless you were you were to grant us this. Um, Dr. Dr. Helfert uh, is the owner of that entity, and that's typically how a lot of DSOs are set up. But there's absolutely a relationship here where, you know, for example, I think any of the opportunities typically will be coming from Jet Dental as the DSO. We will be um, the ones responsible or the ones creating the business opportunities. Um, Dr. Helfert uh, would be the clinical person on site and the clinical head and clinical leader as the, as the dentist on site and, and overseeing that responsibility um, there, there locally. Um, and all of our, all of the dentists who work with across the country, um, of course, have, have that ultimate authority, right? If they say, Hey, um, we, we can't operate today, for example, because, um, you know, this x-ray unit's not working. I'm just giving a, a fake example, a fictitious example. They have that right to call that, right? So, um, as the DSO, we're, we're, we're helping with the business side of setting up opportunities for the business. Um, but Dr. Helford's responsible for the clinical side of the business and for being there on site. Um, so again, I think we wanted to make that clear by having a couple members of, of Jet Dental here on the call uh, that this this would be um, this mobile license that Dr. Helfert's applied for and um, would be used uh, when, if he were to utilize it, it would be to, to utilize with opportunities for Jet Dental. I think one of the other questions we had that didn't really get resolved was, um, for example, how Dr. Helfert or the previous dentist that was going to work with the state of Indiana could be in, for example, um, doing direct supervision of the hygienist in Michigan City and also Evansville at the same time. You know, there, it, 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 prescription supervision won't work with this. There are too many features where you just can't um, turn the hygienist loose on their own, according to state statute. In Indiana. So Dr. Helfert is going to have to be at one location, then he could be at another location the next day or whatever like that. Well, so, we don't have, Dr. Um, Finn, we don't sorry. have multiple. Op yeah. Yeah. I, I was just going to say, I, I'm not sure where the multiple operations at the same time is coming from. That's, that's not something that, that exists. But. Well, I think it's a fair question, Dr. Helfert here. So at this point, you know, um, as Jordan said, Jet and I haven't signed paperwork. We don't have a relationship. And um, I wasn't sure how this licensure thing would work. I, um, if Jet can apply for the license, I agree with the gentleman was Ed or Edward who said that perhaps Jet should have it. It just seems more clean to me. I'm willing to do this, but my whole point of doing this was to be able to work with Jet. Now, Dr. Finley, I, I agree with you absolutely. If I'm in Carmel or in Indianapolis, I can't have direct supervision of a hygienist. What I've seen with the other mobile dental organizations is there's a dentist on site. So you don't have hygienists going in and just doing their thing without a, a dentist there with them. They are actually going as a team setting. So you have a dentist, a hygienist or two, and a couple of assistants. Uh, for instance, I did that this last year in South Bend a lot. I spent about five days a week in a hotel and my team would show up with all the the equipment. We would set it up in a, a school, somewhere in the school, in a gymnasium, in a room. And we'd see 20 or 30 kids and do a lot of preventive care and do a lot of referring out for things. Maybe some SDF if you had some kids who really needed it. But for the most part, we're referring out the, the um, operative dentistry and greater to a local dentist. And, and generally speaking... I think Big Smiles has a list of three or four dentists in the area, so they're not just referring to one dentist. I think Jet would do the same thing. We've talked with uh, uh, several different organizations about how we could have the MOA with different dentists in different areas. So I just want to be very clear. I, I want to be absolutely above board with this. Whatever You tell us how we need to do this the right way. I just want to work. And I don't want to do anything that's that's wrong or that's not absolutely correct and above board, nor does Jordan, nor does Dr. Johnson. I mean, these guys seem like pretty good guys, We've got to know each other over the last few months. And everything they've said to me has been, we want to be ethical, we want to do it right. And that's why I'm on board with it. So 
Well, so Dr. Tell us Holbrook, what, yes, sir. If, if you'd like to withdraw your application and work those bugs out, that's certainly fine with us. That, that makes sense to me, Jordan. Does that make sense to you as well? Like we can withdraw this application and then. Have yeah, I think that's fine, but I also think it's it is semantics um, a little bit. I mean, you know, I think that's we're okay. being very I mean, clear about about who we are. My only other concern is I think there's, you know, this has been a a long time. Obviously, that um, just to get this just to get this meeting. Obviously, it takes takes quite a bit of time. It's obviously your decision, Doctor Helfert. I'm, you know, we're not going to force you to do to do anything. Sure. Yeah. No, I right. also, I also just wanted to reiterate what Doctor Helfert said. We always will have a dentist on site and and practicing uh, with the hygienist. That's exactly the exactly the model you described with big smiles is what our model would look like. It'd just be with adult uh, adult patients, obviously, uh, and at yeah. and at a business place. Well, to Doctor yeah. Finley's point, uh, I do think it makes. We should talk about this, Jordan. I just want this to be clean and right and have everybody understand what's going on and no, no questions in anybody's mind, because I'm not, none of us want to do that. We just want to deliver excellent dentistry. So uh, perhaps at this point, I should withdraw my application and we should come back at this um, through Jet Dental. And, and, and Dr. Finley, if I withdraw my application today and for some reason the Jet is not able to submit an application, can I reapply later? To do like yeah. so I don't want to play any games or go around any circles. I just want to be able to work. Yeah, there's there's I don't see an issue. Let's see what yeah, our I attorney says. I, I don't exactly uh not necessarily an issue, but uh it would we wanted to table this just because uh he could because he could form it. He doesn't necessarily have to be in, in front of the board at the point that he withdraws the application. If we wanted to table the matter, I'm just trying to avoid a situation where he has to reapply and pay a second fee oh, it's yeah. essentially going okay. to be this. Oh, okay. so if, we wanted to, if we wanted to table this because he wouldn't if he withdraws he doesn't really have a way to reactivate it if we table it and he keeps it out there uh it sounds like he's very amenable to it being pushed off at this point so i think i think that would be appropriate and if it reaches the point that we can go the jet dental route then he can just you know behind the scenes give a call and say hey go ahead and withdraw that application what that's you, a great what idea of, what do you think of that board <clears throat> table you had comment Annette. i just wanted to tag on to ed's comment that if the billing is being handled through jet dental then i would assume that the license for the mobile dentistry should be theirs so i'm in agreement that 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 jet dental should be the one applying for the mobile license if they're the ones that are doing the billing services doc i think we can table this for you if you'd like we can if you would you you want us to table this? Yes, sir, please. I think that's the right move. And thank you for that suggestion, Mr. Okay. Council. Okay, so um, a motion to that effect? Someone's second. Okay, any other discussion? I Is mean, it possible to, to schedule the next, um, to be on the next time the board is together now, or is that something we need to, Senate. I'm not sure how that works. Apparently it is, yes. Okay. Any other discussion? All in favor of tabling this, allowing Dr. Helfert to work out some bugs? Thanks. Aye. Is that everybody? Okay. All right. So um, you heard some of our discussion and whatnot. So we'll see you again soon. Yes. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And I want to apologize for not appearing in person, but I... I did that Gen Con dance a few years ago where I showed up and spent four hours trying to find a parking place. Uh, I think, uh, yeah. so sorry that I didn't show up in person, but it wasn't personal. There were a lot of bizarre looking people on the streets of Indianapolis <laughs> this morning. It's a fun time. So, All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone. I appreciate your time. You have a great thank day. Thank you. Thank you. I got to take about a five or 10 minute break so I can get some water. I'm getting dried out. That was, that was very timely. Thank you. Uh, okay, so let's go to applications for review. So let's see if I can get this. Arlette Alcantara Mondragon LDH. I think I got it. We, I could be corrected, but we'll try that. Okay, so let's see. Illinois Dental Hygienist. Uh, Went to Parkland College, no yes questions. The 
deal with this is there were several fails on CRDTS. What what uh, kind of discussion you guys have on this? Three failings on the MDTH. No, oh, yeah. Three failings on the N B D H E. Um, what else you guys got there? Any other dialogue on this? Anybody ready to ready to make a motion? I'll make Ed, a motion. Ed. I, I motion to do, deny application based on the failed three times. Ed and a second. Same. Who seconded that? Um, okay. Jeff? Okay. Any other discussion? All right. All in favor? Signify by saying aye. Okay. Sounded unanimous to me. Um, this was kind of interesting. Let me find this on the computer. It's kind of a long name here. Let me get this together. Okay, so. No, no, I'm no. I'm sure you, yes, I'm sure you didn't. Yes, it's uh, um, Dr. Micah J. M King Blaze. I'll call him Dr. Blaze. Uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, went to Case Western, Ohio license. Answered yes to no question number one concerning disciplinary actions. Um, Took the rib past that. Looks like Kentucky license is okay. Ohio license is being inspected. Is it? Because we were we were looking at that just thinking inspection. Okay, that's good for that you picked that up. Appreciate that. Um, no actions on Kentucky license didn't look like yet. And he's applying for licensure in Indiana. Don't have any other notes except for he did mention he had tattoos and wives. So I would move to deny based on uh, his current uh, summary suspension in Ohio. Okay. Is there a second to that? Second. And just to cover our bases, uh, no issue with the result. But um, because because summary suspension exists in a uh, I, I think there's at least a little bit of room for argument as to whether a summary suspension is a disciplinary sanction in the same way that a permanent sanction is. I would I would cite both that statute and then also, um, let me get it up in front of me here because I think just to just to make sure you're on the best sure. line with this. Sure. Um, on a load. Um, basically, the other the other thing from the disciplinary statute. Um, I work my way into it here. It's 25194. Westlaw made me log back in, so that's why I'm filling the uh, space with ums and uhs, but now I'm here. Um, okay, so it's because it, there, there is a basis for sanction here that it is. Uh, that the practitioner continue to practice, although the practitioner had become unfit due to uh, physical or mental disability. That that would be the other one. So, so I would on that basis, it actually comes back to uh, IC twenty five one nine sixteen. Either way, I mean that's what enables you to say no uh, when a person applies for licensure. So I would just, um, I guess, just to make sure that we're calling on both of those bases. Uh, the applicant has been disciplined by a license. Yeah, okay. I guess it all falls under the same statute anyway, because it's because it's all one subsection that refers to has been disciplined or has committed an act that would have subjected the applicant to the disciplinary process had they been licensed in Indiana when the act occurred. It, either one of those is met. So I guess just very generally, it's under that one. Under the, on the basis of twenty five one nine sixteen a one, denial is appropriate. Uh, other discussion. 
a move. Did you move that? No. Yeah, you moved it. I, I, yeah. I don't think it, it was, was seconded. Oh, okay. Okay, okay. Okay. As long as we've got that covered. Okay. Any other discussion then? What the dates were? I, I don't know if it's at dates and dates. It's yeah. the last uh, 22, page 22. It's the notice of opportunity for hearing in the case, May 1st, 2024. And uh, it goes, Dear Dr. Brooks, in accordance of chapter with Chapter 119, the Ohio Revised Code, da 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 da, da And it goes into it that um, we that the Ohio State Zone Board proposes under authority of ORC to suspend, place, or probationary status, revoke, refuse, or to renew, or refuse to reinstate or censure your license to practice dentistry for the following reasons. Yeah, but it gives it gives a, a listing of what you could do, but it doesn't say that in, per se, does it? Yeah, it, you're, no, you're actually right, because it... It proposes had, under I, authority to suspend, da 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 da, da or censure for the following. So it's it's doing it, any of those for this reason yeah, yeah that's the hearing notice um yeah, yeah we, I, I guess oh, it okay is i mean i thought he was under investigation but i didn't pick up on that of course there again my laptop blew up i'm i'm looking it up here it says okay board action and great it's I click into it, it says enforcement PDF, except that that's just text. If you, oh, there it is. Um, so that's just a, a hearing? That's just the, that's so notice for, to... so I guess the notice for hearing as of May 2024, uh, it's true. He's facing an action right now. Um, so they didn't have the hearing yet? No, so the process, yeah, the, the fact that the process is not complete is not strange, given that we're less than three months since the time that he was notified of an ongoing proceeding. Um, so it's true. He, Based on this, it does not look like he has yet been disciplined, which is not to okay. exonerate him in any way, but the fact of the lack of discipline probably should be recognized. So, I, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, glad that, I'm glad this got questioned because I agree that the discipline hasn't occurred yet. Um, <clears throat> but where it states that he was under investigation. Yeah, the, well, being investigated wouldn't, being investigated by itself would not necessarily um, be the basis for denial. Now, it does say has committed an act that would have subjected the applicant to the disciplinary process had the applicant been licensed in Indiana when the act occurred. My which again comes back to that thing about unfit to practice due to I mental. That's I, I, there, there is that basis. My, my only nervousness with that is that it re, is that I have tended to read that as something where a person has practiced. Um, I, I think when the when Title Twenty Five of the Indiana Code refers to practice, they're generally referring to Indiana practice without having ever necessarily said that. Now, with that said. It does look like uh, I don't know. I my misgiving, and I I get it. I read the letter too, uh, yeah. so I understand exactly why the board wants this result. But I yeah, well, I think that's probably a, that's probably a good step. I mean, because here, here's the thing. I think. Uh, I mean, that should if the board, it, it is a little bit dangerous for the board to take the step of adjudicating their action before they have, basically, because you're, you're basically deciding this on the basis of he's been accused of something, which by itself is not anything. And then uh, and then in reply, he's sent a letter that does not give confidence to the board so, in terms of his ability to be fit. So to do practice, we want to put a time on this that it pops back up like at the second meeting or something? Or do we want to just yeah. table it until he calls checking on it or something or 
Yeah, it's a uh, because surely something will be going going on. Yeah, I, in no way am I like suggesting that that it, this should be granted uh, over over what the board wants, but I do I do think that there's probably reasonable uh, basis to withhold a decision because we don't necessarily have because because right now you would be basically denying on the basis that he's been accused of something and that his letter sure seems to not give confidence that that's going right. to go well for him right. but um That's, that sounds real good. Uh, what do what do y'all think about that? Well, there's right now there's a pending motion that could be withdrawn. I yeah. think. Uh, yeah. My my question, uh, maybe question for Leaf. Um, in this letter, it says on or about May fourth, in probate court, you were found by clear and convincing evidence to be mentally ill in need of treatment in order to be placed under the care of University Hospital. So that's saying by clear and convincing evidence in a probate court it was said that he needed mental health counseling. So until we see from a medical authority that he's better, that tells me that he's unfit to practice. That's, that's a good point. Uh, it, while that, while what you said is not discipline in another jurisdiction, it does give more of a leg to stand on than just what I'm saying. What I, when I said that you're, you're basically, convicting them on the basis of a letter that does not give confidence you're right so if, there, if there's been a judgment of a contested proceeding in court then you do have so could we just re request at a future time fitness for duty and provide us with a fitness for duty or, or we're just going to can it right now for me? i i would stand by my motion to deny okay. because he's been found to be mentally ill did you get a second i agree with that? ed i mean matt Twyla. Second. Yeah, I'm, I'm more comfortable endorsing the motion now. Now okay. that he pointed that out, I, okay. it's a good point. Yeah. Ed, you were wanting to say something? Well, no. Uh, well, yeah, it's 25. It still is 251916 because it refers to an act that would have subjected the applicant to the disciplinary process. And it, if it's practicing while being unfit, then that, uh, I, I guess the only, the only hedge on that is was he practicing, but. Uh, because it, because it does say practicing while being unfit, not simply being unfit. But I do think that you have, I don't know. I, I think there's enough there to make a good faith reading that. It says has been. Well, it says that practitioners had disciplinary action taken against their license. It, against their license, yes. Which is been done. Right. Yeah. They whatever that court decision is, they wouldn't be the ones with jurisdiction over his license. So that part, I think, I think we can still conclude we don't have that particular prong of it because I don't think a board has a board has begun the process of taking an action, but less than three months ago, and uh, probably have not finalized anything yet, and therefore we don't yeah. have that, but we have. But we have this from 2023. Um, okay, you had a motion and a second. Any other discussion on this? All right. All in favor of denying, well, Dr. Blaze, um, an Indiana license, please signify by saying aye. 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 Pretty much everybody. Okay. Okay, uh, let me let me get this other one up here. Okay, let's see how I do with this. I uh, Awais Idris Mufti DDS. Okay, Newburgh, Indiana, USD IUSD. Colorado license, uh, CDCA failed prosthodontics, October 22, November 22, February 23. Discussion on this. this is Motion. 
Okay. Ed was a second. Any other discussion? I just have kind of a question. So um, this does meet the three strikes he's applying, or she, he or she, but re applying by exam, so does not qualify. If this person were to reapply by reciprocity, I think they just get a license, right? Because they have an active license in another state. So there's this workaround <laughs> sort of thing that exists. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. But we're denying because they applied by exam. Yeah. Okay. Or if he would join the compound. Yeah. Yeah. Any other discussion? All in, in favor of denying um, Mufti's last um, uh, license, excuse me, Mufti's license to practice in the state of Indiana, please signify by saying aye. 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 Is that everybody? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's see, we're on Nikita Patel. This guy comes up. I'm finding these little buttons on here a little better better than I thought I would. That's good. Um, dental hygienist, Des Plains, Illinois. Florida and Michigan licenses in dental hygiene. Um, see, one of the things looks like was uh, man, I'm going to stay away from that one. G-U-J-A-R-E-L, University in India. Um, Five-year bachelor dental surgeon degree. Uh, comments, questions? Can't imagine. Can't imagine. So is, did she pass? A regional and national. So CDCA. Okay. So, uh, where are we here? Um, okay. Yeah, the uh, we do have the educational credential evaluators. You know, which are telling us that that um, program is a five-year bachelor degree in dentistry, and then. I guess this is she. Yes, yes. Kind of like the Florida, the Florida things, you know. But this person, this person didn't graduate from an accredited school anywhere in the states. Is that correct? She's taken all the exams and passed them. But she misses on the. On, the on institution that she practiced at is not a accredited. Uh, I think that's where we're. That's we, we've other. kind of set the precedence on this the last two or three meetings because we've gotten a lot of Florida applicants because Florida changed their state statute to allow foreign trained hygienists to come and practice. But our precedence has been no on these. Yeah, um, we had last meeting we had two just back to back, same exact things. Meeting before that, I think there were maybe three through Florida. It's Florida licensing. So let me just talk to you about accreditation standards. So you have institutional accreditation. So that means, so I'm just talking in generalities. So Indiana University is an institution that is accredited by higher learning, which is completely different than CODA. When you have CODA accreditation, that is for each specific program within the dental school, okay? So the DDS program is accredited, dental hygiene, dental assisting, and then all of the specialties have their own individual accreditation. What that accreditation means is that that institution is teaching to the degree that they are going to turn out safe, and competent practitioners based upon what we are required to teach our students in order to gain licensure. So 
just kind of keep that in mind because when we see people coming to us from non-accredited programs, they've maybe got a dental degree from a foreign country, we don't know what they've been taught in specific subject matter material. Like I specifically have to check these boxes that I am ensuring my students can have the knowledge in these areas. Now, maybe this person has passed the NBDAG. I don't know, we don't have those scores. Some people are good test takers. I, I don't know that, but I just want you to kind of think about why CODA is there and, and why it's important that those educational facilities or those educational institutions that are, that are um, offering these programs have that that accreditation it's it is very important okay thanks thanks twyla other comments i was just going to ask twyla the is this one any different because you know reading through this they did do this adhlax at florida and passed um in the csce and then down below they did the um the cdca clinical and written um, with Michigan. Well, no, that's a history. They did do that in the past. Does that make any difference on this applicant compared to any of the others that we've seen? It, it doesn't to me. Okay. Uh, the one thing that I do have concern about is this person, I think, has a Michigan license, and yeah. I looked up Michigan statute, and <laughs> I think Michigan statute's very similar to ours. I'm not quite sure how that happened. So I don't know, I, I don't want to say somebody made a mistake, but but from what I researched, that's kind of what I felt. So does Michigan statute address CODA approved? Yes, it's very similar to okay, ours. Real similar to ours. Okay. So that, you know, if it's, they're going by reciprocity and they're coming from a state that has very similar to us that's that's my question is um like florida doesn't but seems michigan does do they get do they have some consideration based on that or is this just kind of cut cut and dry that that is a it is a bit of an odd question that it's not completely out of the bounds of reality that if because the standard that you're following is do the states or jurisdictions uh, requirements are substantially equal to those of Indiana? And if the possibility comes up that the answer to that is yes, but that that jurisdiction appears to have made a mistake, I don't exactly know where that leaves us. Hmm. Because making the decision of we're denying on the basis that Michigan should have denied you is kind of outside of like, and of course it's not, you know, uh, not that any board couldn't make a mistake, of course, of course, any of them could. So it's it's possible that that would happen, but I, I think you are still basing it on whether they have the license uh, from a place with substantially equal requirements. So I, it it is it is potentially a difficult situation. Oh yeah. And I don't think we should base our decision on Michigan's decision in case they made a mistake. The decision be based upon their educational equivalency. And like you said, when you looked it up on the website, it clearly stated that they're in agreement with us with the CODA. So if that's what's in their statutes, that's what's in ours, that's what we should base it on, upon not the decision that the board made in case they made a mistake. Anything else? So, Annette, are you prepared to make a motion? It just becomes that? a bit of it. It just becomes a bit of a difficulty at the stage of sending a denial letter if we're sending a denial letter on the basis because if the denial letter is that the state that she is licensed in is not substantially equivalent to Indiana's, and that's not actually our judgment, that it becomes becomes a problem. I'm not exactly sure what the letter is going to say. I mean, I get I understand what the problem is for sure. Uh, but if it's a reciprocity um, license, I don't know. I, I don't want, I, I mean, in no way do I want to land at a result where it's like you're stuck with somebody else's potential mistake. I don't want to impugn the board of Michigan, but I, I uh, but it, I don't know. Um, 
it is still a reciprocity application. So I'm trying to get to the best level of support possible for what, for what it sounds like uh, the mood of the board is on this. Um, so it's governed by 2514-116. Um, furnishes proof satisfactory to the board that the applicant is a dentist who is licensed in another state that has licensing requirements substantially equal to those that affect in Indiana, has practiced dentistry for at least two or three years preceding the application, passes the law exam, has completed the required hours of CE in the previous two years and meets all of the requirements of this chapter. Well, that's it. Right. That chapter that meets all the other requirements of the chapter. Boom. I, I feel much better the, the fact that that's in there because now you have something that conflicts with something else within the chapter because that's not just that one statute. It's right. also, it's it's elsewhere in 2514-1, right? Um, so, yeah, based on the fact that it doesn't meet that, that, I think that's what we have to rely upon because she has a Michigan license and we think Michigan is equivalent, but it runs afoul of something else in 2514-1. So on that roundabout way, because she does have Michigan licensure, I think that's what you have to go with. But, well, but you can still have the same result that you seem to be leaning toward. I'll move that. Okay. Where'd that come from? Tw file a second. Okay. All right. Any other discussion on this? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All right. Sound like everybody. Let's see. Okay. We're all, we're down to the one with all the reading here. There's a lot of reading in this. Let me find that. Kind of cool. My little loner, my little loner laptop is really a lot faster than mine was. So. I feel slightly bad for seeing boom when I arrived at denying somebody's license, yeah, but <laughs> still, that's it. I was yeah, well, just glad that I got to the point that I could like yeah. legally justify this. I thought that was a boom from <laughs> from your brain waves all coming exactly. together. It was. So, uh, everything it came was. together at the right time. Okay. So if, uh, if you want, oh, you got to go for it. You had a question or something? Well, no, I was just going to go on to. Oh, Dr. I'll describe this one. Okay. So yeah, we're on the last one. I guess I'm calling him uh, Richard Roll. We'll try that. Um, got a lot of things going on here. Marked yes to disciplinary action. Yes to malpractice judgments. North Carolina probation disciplinary action back a while back. Um, shoot, just I kind of on and on with. Um, actually, this is the one I kind of wanted to comment on. This is the one where they what they call them board members or designees to go out into the practice and see what's going on as investigation. So you know maybe we could have spanned some of that time had our had the MOU or that, um, excuse me, that statute been written to, for Indiana such that board members could have done that. They didn't need to be paid, but we could have switched and the board members could have gone out and done some of these things, then recused themselves from the hearing and just offered up their observations that they saw because they sure picked a lot of stuff up on, on this guy. But anyway, um, that being said, what do you all think? Uh, yes, if, Richard. If, if you want, I can have a quick summary of this. In yeah, 2020, ahead. there were four patient complaints and his license was suspended for six months. Then in 2023, a board designee yeah. went to visit his office. Two, I believe. Yeah. And all of his drugs in his emergency kit were expired. He had one assistant that was CPR BLS trained, and you're supposed to have two when you're doing those types of procedures in that particular state. And then he snuck out the back door so he didn't have to uh, have uh, uh, a confrontation, confrontation there, with the designee from the board. Uh, and his license was again subs uh, suspended uh, of May 20. Fifth of twenty-three for six months, so two suspensions and uh, in a period of three years. Uh, I I don't know what more I have to say. 
this 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 license is currently on probation, on probation in North Carolina until yeah. 2020 yeah. uh March yeah. of 25. Yeah. And aside from that, I kind of think he falsified his application. Um let's see what were the things I was looking at on that. Furthermore, my commit commitment to continuous professional development is evident in participation in continuing education courses, blah, 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 which he had two and a half out of 20 when he was audited. Um, oh, come on. I was on a roll on evaluating this, evaluating, I was, yes, so to speak. I don't know that we need to kick this can in. All right. A motion and a second to that? I'll second. Uh, all right. So we've got a second by Richard. All in favor, signify by, by saying aye. All right. Thank you. Let's see. Um, I was I was on a. No, I was, on. Let's see. I, I maybe should re reworded that or should have reworded. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Continuing education. We decided that was just a renewal discussion. Let's run through the compliance fund compliance officers update. Okay. So anyway, uh, I think. Compliance officer contracts are on the move again. Um, I had actually Amy was trying to track that down and Leif was working on tracking that down and uh, Lindsay Hire. Anyway, it's, it's got, the, the contracts have kind of fallen in a black hole someplace since our last meeting, but they're on the move now. Then Leif, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, the because as of an update two, three weeks ago, I made sure that everything on both the OAG and IPLA end had been done. It was going, um, it, it had to go through the process of encumbering the funds. I, do, I don't pretend to know what these uh, bureaucratic terms necessarily mean in all cases. So I think it was with another agency making sure that those things got untied. Uh, when another update was sought earlier in the week, it was redirected to me to finish off drafting the contract. The contract has now been sent um, to the compliance officers in question. The only steps really left in the process are they review it. They say, yes, I'm willing to sign this, assuming that they are uh, based on the language and the language was boilerplate. So, you know, you, ex you expect that's a yes, but obviously everybody before they put pen to paper is does it does well to read it. And uh, so they're, they're reviewing it right now. Once they say yes, it will get circulated for formal signatures and those are and and then the contract needs to be approved but those are the only steps left so we really shouldn't be very far away at this point um and the contract has to be approved by whom yet our office oh. so it would it would come it would just come to say any state contract we we process we uh, we review every single state agency contract including our own um so that's the only thing. Once we have the signatures, it just gets routed into our system. Uh, we try to get those looked at, I, we say a week, but most of the time I do it within a business day uh, to, get, to get mine looked at. Hopefully my colleagues are doing likewise. I don't know whether it will get assigned to me or one of my colleagues, but all of us, I think, do a good job of getting them along quickly. So I don't think we're very far away at all. I, un unlike other processes where I'm not uh, where I don't want to write a check in terms of uh, say, saying just how quickly something's going to happen. I actually feel pretty good that we are very close here. Yeah, I, I mean, I was kind of kicking around the idea of moving to Indianapolis and just kind of coming to government center every day, hanging with everybody and see where they went. You know, like <laughs> I know the wife would like to get rid of me for a while. So maybe that would be something I should consider, I guess, just follow the, follow the contract on a daily basis. All right. Sounds like maybe that's in the works. So what do you guys, um, you've got this report in front of you compliance uh, dental compliance fund um have the uh, what is it, 120,000 bucks for potential compliance officer contracts the rest of it being invested the rest of it's done well looks like uh, with investments keep things going any comments move on from there looks like we're access practice agreement let me uh get this out of here so this um if i can find where i was there uh discussion someplace oh there it is okay so um i talked to nelly chalwa at the 
uh, State Department of Health. In fact, um, she was just bouncing things off of me as far as, you know, she's really behind this as far as would like to figure out a way to get this moving. I don't know how many of you remember that. I didn't remember very much until I started looking into it and uh, uh, read some, some more on it. Uh, Ed Rosenbaum sent me a, a potential practice contract or sample contract, I guess I should call it from 2018, I guess it was. So the law was enacted for this in, the statute was enacted this for 2000, in 2018. There was a change in 2023. Um, they thought it might help if you had a local dentist or instead of having a dentist in a particular county that the hygienist would be in to be out kind of practicing in a charitable type situation on her own if that could be spread across the state. So for example, what was enacted is such that um, somebody in Marion County could have multiples of these out into other counties around the state. The thing is, um, the reason uh, Nelly Chow wanted some, our, our discussion or input on why this really hasn't taken off at all. Um, and that's what I would hope you guys would kind of address. I, I guess one of the one of the obvious things to me is it would be uh, the, the potential liability factor. I know, so part of, the, part of this uh, agreement uh, would be that the hygienist would carry their own malpractice insurance. If you remember on this or from your reading, of course, they can offer preventive services only without a dentist having examined the patient. So they could go in and for, they could have a profi anyway. Um, what other preventive services? They wouldn't be doing root planing. They couldn't do anesthesia that way. Um, so anyway, it's just not ever taken off. And she had some, I was actually talking to her just a couple of days ago on this. There are some interesting side notes on that. She's hoping to be able to uh, maybe even because some of these facilities that the hygienist would work at, for example, local health departments, FQHCs, uh, I can't think of what all, but basically those areas, the hygienist might be able to do somewhat on off hours. For, for example, if they want to just come out and do a few hours on a Saturday, it, it gets it all and, and maybe promotes some of these hygienists getting back into the workforce. The other thing that um, this could accomplish would be, for example, going to local health departments and just talking under the auspices uh, of the of a dentist, uh, a practice agreement dentist would be able to just kind of speak about oral hygiene, early childhood carries, things of that, that nature at some of these. And so there again, she would be, she or he, the hygienist would be on their own with the exception of they would still have this dentist um, kind of supervisor, I guess you'd call it or whatever. It's like a collaborator with um, nurse practitioners. And those guys are where they might have several nurse practitioners with under them, under them as, a, as physicians. So anyway, that's where we got, how we got here. Oh, okay. And I use also doing a survey. Um, so yeah. this is more through the Indiana Dental Hygiene Association. They're doing a survey to see if they're, they can bring about some interest to access practice agreements. Um, you know, hygienists can go and give, you know, oral health projects. They don't have to have an ass uh, an access practice agreement to do that. Um, I I don't know why this hasn't taken off. I think it just takes effort to put this into place. And I think that's why it hasn't really taken off. When you think about a federally qualified healthcare center, you know, if they are, if they are truly an FQHC, um, they do have to provide dental as well. So most of the FQHCs in the Indianapolis area have dental clinics. I think um, Indy HealthNet has four or five. Uh, Eskenazi has FQHCs in this area. There's Riggs, which is another FQHC. They employ dentists and hygienists. I'm not sure of the FQHC angle about that. Of course, manpower shortage areas don't seem to be picking up with this. Um, I, I just think it takes a lot to put this into place, and I, I, I just don't know if 
the right hygienist dentist relationship has occurred to to make this happen i i don't know The, they would have their own malpractice. The, it, it, it specifies in that in that statute someplace that they have their own own malpractice. Um, I guess some of the other little features on that, um, the hygienist would basically be qualified the same as one that would be qualified to do um, uh, prescription supervision, where she has 2,000 hours in within the first two years. Uh, can't use local anesthetics out by herself uh, or himself, whichever. Um, there were several features like that that are in this um, uh, Title 25 statute. Um, they have to have, the billing would be through the dentist, through the dental office for this outreach hygienist. And then they would be, typically, she, she or he would be paid from that dental office. Um, what am I forgetting, Ed? Records. Records. Records, yeah. Records be another thing. They have to be EMR type stuff. So whether they would probably be kept at the dental office, they, I guess, could be kept on site. If this collaboration ceases, um, she needs to provide, the hygienist needs to provide all this stuff to the responsible dentist within a day. The hygienist cleans the teeth, sees things that need to be attended to, sends them back to this, uh, for lack of a better word, sponsored dentist or has a choice of two other dentists. I think there'd be somewhat of a hassle with um, getting Medicaid guys, either number one, having people pick up qualifications to do Medicaid or the second thing is wanting, not particularly wanting more Medicaid patients. I think that'd be a hassle. Uh, I, on this Medicaid road, if, if so, if you decided to join Medicaid to take care of these patients through this, would you be obligated to see patients in your practice then, uh, Medicaid patients? Well, practice. Uh, I mean, I think that's definitely a hassle. If nothing else, it's just your phone would be ringing off the hook probably because nobody takes Medicaid. I'm curious much. what the question is about the access practice agreements. I mean, oh, she's so just wanting input on from dentists out in the state to try to see is there a way to get this moving or some way to get moving or something? I think Medicaid came out with some big things that are going to be required of practitioners. You should have gotten that email. I guess something about that, yeah. Um, what's, sorry, I don't receive it, kind of. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. Anything. I guess I don't understand what she wants of the board, though, to Twyla's point. What does she want us to do? Just discussion. Like, any way to improve this program. I think I think that's best handled by the IDA. So Pardon? she should talk. I, I think she should talk to the IDA. I mean, the IDA has the voice of the dentist of Indiana. We just have... Yeah. I mean, there's nothing for us to do with this, I don't think. Uh, she just wanted to pick your brain for a few minutes. All right. Was this if you're just asking, like, personal opinions, I'm not going to go out and do anything with this as a dentist. I'm not going to go that, st start a remote was, clinic. So if you want wanted. my personal opinion, it doesn't affect me at all. I have no interest in doing this. Right, and your reasons would be... It, like, I want to focus on my patients and my practice. I have no interest in taking on more risk with other providers at a remote location. Good. If I was a hygienist 20 years ago, I still wouldn't be interested in doing this at all. First of all, they got, they got the hygienists to pick up their insurance, right? Well, hygienists will have their own insurance. The dentist, of course, will have his insurance. Right. Malpractice insurance for hygienists is very inexpensive. Yeah. 
Oh, it is. Oh, it's like ninety nine dollars a year. Oh, I think our our That's our RNs, excuse me, our registered nurses in the health department are like three hundred bucks a year. You know, it's it's insignificant stuff. It's not much. Yes. Was Ed? Um, it was was this whole system predicated on? I can't remember the exact term, like Alaska, and there's some remote places that have these. Mid-level, mid that's it. Was this thing... Is this Indiana's response to that mid-level provider? No, 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 no. The the statute, the law, this, 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 well, this, in, this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, the ADA has quite a backdoor to a program that has a lot of Okay. All right. No other comments? Okay. Let's move to the EFTA duties. Matt, you want to speak to this? Yeah, sure. So um, I got an email. This was a few weeks ago from a instructor in the IU Fort Wayne dental assisting program that um, had talked with JG Vlick with IDA and been told that uh, dental assistants, from his knowledge, could not place sealants in Indiana based on um, it being a duty specified to hygienists in the Practice Act. I told him my reading of that was the exact opposite, that it was a delegatable duty to dental assistants. And um, since there was some discrepancy, I told him I'd bring it before the board. I know I've talked with a couple of you guys already, and it sounds like everybody I've talked to is in agreement with me that dental assistants are allowed to place sealants based on our practice act, but that's the history and why it's here. He was thinking that they were not. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't know. I can remember forever ago. Uh, I guess I'm lucky I can remember it, but anyway, <laughs> like probably 1984, or 1985, I got a light with a big wand on it. And one of the things we started routinely doing, they had a couple of assistants then that stayed with me for a long time, but they started doing sealants with that thing right after that. It was, it was taught, it was taught at IU at the expanded functions clinic years and years ago for assistants. Um, yeah, and just to be specific, the line of statute that was in question, um, section eleven. Uh, I forget it, 4, 25, 11, what? Um, but anyway, it, it states, applies an, uh, a person who is deemed to be practicing dental hygiene within the meaning of this chapter, um, who, four, applies and uses within the mouth such antiseptic sprays, washes, or medicaments for the control and prevention of dental caries. And his thought was sealants were a medicament. And I told, I told him my interpretation is a sealant is a restorative mat uh, material, restorative procedure. It's not a medicament. Therefore, um, a sealant's actually not a restorative it's material. Not. It'd be more of a preventive restorative material. Yeah. 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 Preventive restorative material. But uh, yeah, it's in that category and not. Yeah. I've, I've sent my assistance to be able to apply fluoride, have education. That's a medicament. I, I, yeah. And this is going to be under your supervision. You're, oh, going, to, you're going to be there sure. forced thing. Yeah. Same as they So were. unless there's any objection, it sounds like everybody's on the same page that it is. So we could just tell Jay the consensus opinion is that it is a procedure, you know, assuming they're properly trained and have been through a, you know, a, a program that instructs them properly on that. Sure yeah, seems that, like there it. is no certificate that's needed. Yeah. So it can be no. on the job. Yeah. 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 It, it, yeah. It, it's, a, it's on the dentist to ensure that they've been properly trained. I, yeah. So, yeah. 
There you I've go. Been, I've been teaching an EFTA class for 30 years and it's in my, it's in my uh, agenda. So I was in violation then if that was wrong. And my program is based upon George Willis's program that he established at IU. So I know teaching sealants to their EFTA program is part of their thing. Yeah, I mean, it's taught in the assisting program. It's taught in the hygiene program. But I don't think, you know, there's nothing in statute that says you have to have a certificate in order to place a sealant on a tooth. You can it, breathe a sigh you of can, relief. You can do it. Thank you. I don't have to. Yeah, I next, think it's just one of the things under meeting. the doctor's auspices. <laughs> yeah. Just out of curiosity, uh, how, how old am I? Has anyone used a wand light? Sure. Oh, yeah, you're kind of old. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll go with that. I'll go with that. <laughs> okay. At least, at least one out of the crew here. He's okay. Snotty's got to be lying about that. Oh, yeah. I, I'm, okay. 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 <laughs> All right. Let's see. Where are we headed? Um, we're headed down. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, Amy, I should have had you on earlier. Sorry about that. Why don't you come on up and discuss the last um, two two month periods, I guess? Good morning, or after, I don't even know what time it is, afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> Just got it. Um, okay, so uh, between April and July, our case age went from um, 6.9 to 7.4. I think there might have been... Um, just a, a minor uh, mistake on the report that I sent out the other day, but 6.9 to 7.4. Um, we had 78, I believe, cases open at the beginning of the year. My goodness. Um, 35 are currently open and 54 have been closed. Over the last, um, I guess, 60 days at this point, we've had 12 cases open and 18 closed. Um, I didn't, I wasn't able to put that on this report that you got this week because our report doesn't graft it that way, but I assume you still have the report from last month too. So Weird. that's where, that's where those numbers are coming from. If you're looking at it and being like, that's not the right number. Um, as you can see with the consumer complaints by County, by resident and complainant, there's not much change in that it's still mostly coming from Marion County. Um, our consumer complaints, uh, most of them are against dentists with 69 and four against hygienist. Um, and then our allegations here are professional malpractice and professional incompetence with being the most still uh, same as the month before. So any questions on investigations? As for litigation, um, we went from 9.5 months for case age to 7.7. .7, so we we're on the downward trend for that one. We had four cases open at the beginning of the year. We currently have four and we've closed one. Um, I think you might be having some come to you soon by the next meeting or at least filed by the next meeting. Um, in the last 60 days, we have, um, let me look at that, right? Yep, um, open to two matters and not closed any litigation files. We currently have uh, four administrative complaints open. Um, as you can see the counties by that, I think I might have accidentally just skipped page. I'm a little out of sorts here, sorry. Um, with litigation charges being mostly professional incompetence. So any questions on litigation? You covered four months pretty quickly, I guess. <laughs> Not a whole lot of change, but just some some declines in, in case ages and an increase in, in investigative complaints. Yeah, we appreciate you not being a featured speaker last time. So you could kind of scoot on and move on that yeah. afternoon. No problem. I, I get to that mobile dental thing that we had talked about earlier. Do you can you talk broadly speaking mm -hmm. if you've received complaints I, related I to mobile dental? I don't think she was in the room. When yeah, we I had to okay. leave, so I don't know. Well, and I don't even mean specific to Jet Dental, but could, if we're talking in general generalities, can can you say whether you've received complaints related to mobile dental operations in the state? Not off the top of my head. I, I mean, I'm I'm not as in deep in these complaints as okay. most. But I haven't seen any that come by my desk that I've approved to close or charge yet. That, but that doesn't mean we don't have some out there. So but that may have, that may have been seen by just like a, a a litigator or whatever that 
Yeah, our my um, assistant section chief looks at all of our cases as they're filed and then assigns them to the investigators. I don't really necessarily see them until the back end when it's time to approve or close them. Um, but I can I can check into that and let you know if we're seeing that trend or not. Can I uh, go on to that? Um, when we get some applications, um, is there any way to know? And everybody's innocent until proven guilty. As, as you as you're that's your job, but like that there's any pending things going on for somebody that's applying? Uh, not investigate. We cannot divulge any of that information if it's regarding to investigation. Our statute requires us to keep that stuff confidential. Now, if we have filed any sort of litigation or IPLA has filed a complaint on behalf of the board against somebody, then Cindy would have that information, but we cannot provide that. I don't know if Leif has any more guidance on that, but that's no. kind of in my understanding. No, it's, it sounds completely reasonable to me. It's I, to me the confidentiality stage. This is, the, the confidentiality statute is such that until the second that they file it, it's it's the same level of confidentiality. There's no like half pregnant. You you kind of just that's what you're half pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> <I like> that. <laughs> yeah, it's it's it's, it's 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 flatly confidential. There's no stages it, yeah, just because they're close. Pregnant. I mean, yeah, internally, I'm sure they have discussions where they're about to charge, and people know that, but that's not for public consumption necessarily. <laughs> yeah. I was just curious if like if there's an open investigation that they're not allowed to apply for something. You know what I'm, I'm asking? Like, Well, the, I mean, if, if, there's I, no law that says that, and there's no way that you would be able to know that. Unless, IP, unless I, unless I, would know. I guess if they openly disclosed that they were under investigation, but I, even then I wouldn't. I think that I think that would only open the door into a line of questioning in which you find out. I mean, if they yeah, if they gave away the game on their personal appearance, which sometimes has happened, they t they give a personal appearance that says enough statements against interest that it causes you to deny that can happen. But otherwise, I don't think that any of that falls to licensing. I think they have to keep it confidential until the second that it becomes a public filing, at which point that entire statute stops applying. And due to the fact that the majority of our investigations uh, lack merit. Like the allegations aren't really um, chargeable or legitimate. I personally would feel comfortable with that because then we might be denying somebody the opportunity for a license without merit. They're not meritorious. I just love that. Anything else? Any other questions? Okay. Well, thanks. All right. Um, let's see. We're just about there, aren't we? Um, any other old or new business? I have something we were talking about maybe putting on that as a, for a discussion item. Uh, what were we talking about on doing that? A discussion item next time. What were we talking about when we were eating? I was munching on something, drinking water. <laughs> yeah, half pregnant. Yeah, it'll come back. Um, let's see. One of the other. Any other older new business for me? By I want. I had one other thing. I um, uh, wanted to thank Lindsay Heyer for talking to the uh, governor's office and uh, finding us a board member pretty quickly, and uh, got a good one. And uh, it was very very quick. Um, I had called and uh, I'd called, um, I hated to, but it was about a week and a half after uh, Ted died and uh, requested that. And they got on it. Appreciate it. Okay, anything else? Yep. Second. All in favor. Okay. Uh, Thank you all.